Good morning, everybody. Are we ready to go? Ready. Okay. Ready. All right. Let's begin this. Uh, good morning. This is the Monday morning briefing of the Mason County Commission for the week of February 22nd, 2021. We're going to go ahead and begin our briefings with uh, the Timberland Regional Library uh, briefing, Cheryl Haywood. Good morning, Cheryl. Good morning. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. And, you know, I don't have any prepared statements, but I think you know me by, that, by now that I could speak very eloquently about all the projects going on in Mason County. Uh, we have also scheduled um, time, tended, a tentative date on March 8, Monday morning for a state of the library for 2020. So my staff are still working on that. So I don't have statistics to share with you and so on for 2020 at this point. Um, but I do wanna thank you. We received the letter last week of your confirmation of uh, Dr. Kenneth Sebi and we immediately forwarded your confirmation letter to the other four counties. And uh, as you know, he can uh, begin to serve once we receive confirmation from the other four counties. So that could take up to four to six weeks. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, I do wanted to let you know that uh, we have been working on a project to refresh the North Mason Timberland Library in Belfair. And uh, we just finished in the last week or two. Uh, this was a project that uh, the, the building itself had not really been refreshed since it was built in 1997, 1998. And so it got a fresh coat of paint on the inside. It got new flooring, <clears throat> new flooring. It got new furniture. It got new desks and a new computer tables. And uh, we are currently... Um, filming the inside so that people could see it remotely on Facebook or, or from our website. So we're working on that right now. That project uh, cost us around $150,000 to do that refresh. Um, and in the past several years, we've uh, had to install an ADA access ramp from the widened uh, Highway 3 down to the entrance. So that was another like about $80,000 project for us. Um, the parking lot is still good there. Um, so overall, oh, and the friends also purchased and um, paid 50% towards, and we paid the other 50% towards an uh, electronic board. So the North Mason Timberland Library is looking really good, really, really good. And if you are interested, we could always arrange a time to meet there to walk through the building. Um, and then the Hoodsport Library in the last several years we have uh, replaced the flooring, re uh, up, upheld the, the flooring joists that there weren't any joists underneath. Um, we've painted it, put in new furniture, put in a new, uh, par re resurfaced the parking lot, and also uh, an ADA ramp with a picnic table out in the front for people to sit, still get Wi Fi, and, um, and see Hood Canal. Um, this year, we're working on a refresh of the city-owned Shelton Timberland Library. Uh, we hope to get that started by the fall. Last year, we received a $60,000 donation for specifically for the Shelton Timberland Library, and those funds will go towards refreshing the bathrooms. Um, so we're very excited about that. The city of Shelton, several years ago, uh, went... Uh, applied for a CDBG grant and received one. And with that, those funds, they were able to uh, shore up the roof and the exterior paint as well and, and address other outside issues um, at the Shelton Timberland Library. All three libraries, actually all of our 27 libraries will be um, receiving upgrades to our wireless infrastructure. Our wireless infrastructure is five years old as of this January. So by the end of this September, we hope to have all, well, we need to have all 27 libraries upgraded. Um, and so as a reminder, we do offer Wi-Fi. Uh, it spills out through it, the parking lot and the sidewalks. We are still offering uh, uh, free printing up to hundred pages per week. We are working towards phase two uh, with uh, sometime in uh, middle of March to April where our buildings will open for limited service up to 30 minutes of internet use, picking up of holds, 
and so on. We have fitted out all of our buildings for different options for different scenarios. So we do have curbside pickup right now. We do have takeout windows in most of our libraries. Um, and so our, our buildings are becoming very flexible, which is a really good thing. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is that we, um, you may have heard me talk about this in the past. We have, um, we did a pilot in 2019 with the city of McCleary and McCleary Timberland Library where we offered up to 91 hours a week of access beyond the 27 core hours that are staffed by our staff. And we called it the expanded access hours pilot. And it turned out to be a very, very positive uh, pilot. We learned a lot um, and we had people. So basically it's uh, it, like I said, it went from 27 hours a week to 91 hours a week from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week. That when, pe when we asked people for their input about the library, regardless of the topic of our survey, they always request more hours, earlier hours, evening hours, Sunday hours. So this was our attempt to do this. It is an opt-in system for people 18 and over. They're allowed to bring their minors with them, their children. Um, and uh, people have used it for workforce development, to apply for jobs, to run their business, to, um, to pick up their holds, to read a newspaper, et cetera. Uh, the people who used it, there were over 400 people who used it. I think it was about 405. And that's a lot for a tiny town of, of McCleary. And many of them came from, like half of them came from the city residents and the other half came from all over the district. And uh, we, we received comments that people really wanted to have it in their own libraries, like at Elma or Montesano or Chehalis. And so um, we've been working steadily towards that. And so this year, right this moment, we are working on, um, we wanted to do this in stages because it's a very complicated, very large project. So we're doing, we're installing the wiring for access controls in 13 libraries right now. And one of the 13 is Hoodsport. So, um, so when, I, when I say that we're doing wireless and we're doing access controls, it's because we can save up to 10 to 15% of the, the cost if we do those two projects together. So that's why we're trying to get all this done before the end of September this year. Any questions so far? Uh, yeah, I, I do, if you don't mind jump, jumping in. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, Cheryl, when you and I had spoken uh, a couple, maybe a few weeks ago at this point, um, one of the uh, issues that I brought up with the um, remote access or the uh, after additional hour access to Hoodsport in particular was um, some security concerns that had been raised um, by folks that live out in the in the Hoodsport area that might be using it. Um, so I just uh, encourage you to, to chat with our sheriff's office about how to ensure that um, you know that, that the facility is uh, you know prepared to handle some of those security concerns or if there's any modifications that need to be made at the grounds or in the building to improve safety. Um, you know, I just encourage you to have that conversation with the sheriff's office. I think uh, Chief Deputy Ryan Sperling has been out there and met with your branch manager, but just to <clears throat> just to make sure we're following up on that element of it. I've noted it. Thank you. Uh, yes, we currently do have cameras there. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have oh, we do have cameras there currently. Uh, on the outside of the building. And these are cameras that to my knowledge can see in the dark and up in the infrared light up to 70 or 80 feet. Um, uh, the cameras that will be installed inside and outside, I mean, we will be able to monitor them as well. Um, but yes, I will follow up with the sheriff or my staff will, yes. And then uh, just real quick, you know, the state is now in phase two finally. Yeah. And so you're, your plans are to open up at in April or May? No, no, no. Sometime in March. Oh, in March. Like in the next few weeks. Sometime everybody is on a different timeline in terms of uh, figuring things out, you know, with the 27 buildings. But yeah, sometime in March, no later than April 1, 
we're opening up phase two. Yes, okay. but no, no restroom access, no meeting room access. It's up to 30 minutes for internet, picking up your holds, you know, light browsing, and then, and then that's it for now. Okay, great. Yeah, and we'll, we'll obviously put that on our website and we'll send out a news release, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do wanna mention uh, that we are working with Hope right now to try to establish a garden, a food forest garden at the Hoodsport Library um, and the executive director, or a, I know that they're going after grants for that. So we're highly, I'm highly optimistic that we're hopefully going to get, I mean, that hope we'll get that grant so that we can do that. I do want to let you know that we do have a very successful Master Gardeners Wazoo Extension Garden at the Salcom Timberland Library that's been there for easily a decade or two. And the food that is raised there is uh, donated to the local food bank. And so we do have a garden there. And it's also like a, a garden literacy um, experience for young children too, because we do a checkout at the Salcom Timberland Library, these backpacks for little children to go out and, and explore the garden. We were also, um, we also have partnered with Grub and uh, offering a garden, uh, although it's a, it, they're raised beds um, at the Olympia Timberland Library. So we are working, so we do have a, a gardens and other um, libraries. And then the other thing I wanted you to know is that Annie Bowers, the manager at the Hoodsport Timberland Library is working with the Hoodsport Port Authority to provide a story trail up at Lake Cushman um, and that she's aiming for early April this year as well. And this will be our third story trail. We have one out in the Randall area, partnering with the US Forest Service. And we have uh, two of them in, in Olympia. So it's fun to see for us this um, literacy for nature trails and literacy with gardening. I know the grub is very popular in uh, Thurston County, so. Yes. Yes. Oh, Randy, you're muted. Randy. Oh. <laughs> Never Sorry mind. About that, guys. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah, I, I just I want to I want to dive into so you know some of the context around why we invited you in for a um, you know briefing and an update was uh, back in the fall we had received a, a letter outlining some concerns about um, some of the changes that were happening at. Uh, TRL, um, in particular with uh, within the administrative and staffing um, parts of the operation. And so I uh, wanted to give you an opportunity to walk through some of those changes, um, discuss how the board, uh, you know, deliberated or didn't deliberate those changes, um, and just provide a little bit of context for us. I know that um, there was a, a follow-up letter provided by uh, you and TRL to go through some of those things, but uh, wanted to have an opportunity for us to have a conversation um, together as a commission on the record with you to just walk through some of those issues and elements of, of the decision making so that, um, you know, if there's any questions from the commission um, that they can be uh, kind of put out there and, and we can walk through those. Sure. So Timberland Regional Library's last classification and compensation study happened or occurred sometime in the middle of the aughts, so somewhere in 2005 to 2007. And, uh, and so we started that process in 2018. It took us several years to do this. We hired a consultant um, and we kept the board informed, of course, because when uh, hiring a consultant required a request for proposal and approval by the board, and uh, the, the consultant did the work, surveyed comparable library systems, both local, mainly locally. Um, and, uh, and we made significant changes to our uh, jobs and to the positions. And um, at the same time, you know, just like county government and city government, as a junior taxing district, Timberland Regional Library is up against the 1% every year. And so that had a big, that between the 1%, between the, the rising cost of minimum wage uh, and the fact that our salaries were not consistent with a going rate. Um, we did a lot of thinking about how we wanted to create more hybrid positions. 
And um, at the same time, um, you know, always looking for cost savings, always looking to become more uh, lean as, as government. And um, during the year of 2020, um, was it 2020, 2019, half the admin team left and for different reasons. Uh, look, they found other jobs, et cetera. And during that year, I think it was 2019, we decided to, um, for us, the remaining four, not, not including me, to take on additional responsibilities. And by doing that, we saved, uh, we saved moving forward over a half a million dollars a year in salaries and benefits. So we started cuts at the top and we have been in a soft hiring freeze since uh, January 2019. Um, and so uh, that combined with the results. And so the timeline for the classification compensation, the full timeline is on our website. And in the fall of 2019, we met consistently with the board of trustees from I think August on an executive session to talk about all the financial impacts and to give them options to consider. And they made their final decision. I believe it was November, 2019. And the decision was to um, uh, basically approve the new job descriptions. And it was a little bit over a million dollars to adjust the salaries that had not been keeping up with the, you know, the market since the middle of the aughts. So the, um, the board was kept informed the whole time and you can go and see on the website in the board packets, you know, we record our meetings like you, we put our, all of our material is on in, in, the, in the board packet. The board did see the old job descriptions and the new job descriptions. They saw the old pay grades. They saw the new pay grades. Um, and uh, the impact to the four remaining admin positions that most of them took on, a, like I said, you know, depending on the position, took on additional departments. Um, the, imp the financial impact to those four admin positions was, um, the 38,000, 36,000 out of the million dollars. And the rest was for the rest of the staff. Um, so that kind of money, you know, I mean, I, I, don't have, I don't have that authority to do that. The board, it was unanimous in the fall, the November 2019 board meeting, it was unanimous to adopt the classification and compensation study. And um, the wages for the most part all the wages that were, all the wages were in the budget for 2020. However, we ran out of time to approve the salaries for admin. They were approved, but they weren't in that budget. And so we had to do, um, you know, that's what we brought to the attention of the board in early 2020. Cheryl, on the you said uh, they took on additional departments. Was there a restructuring? Was there a, where yeah. some people let go and they took on their work, or did you just move yeah. around the, the chairs? So what we did was, um, so IT left. Our head of IT was was hired back at Amazon for like double the salary that we couldn't afford to pay him, obviously. So he left, he was the first to leave. And so then we, I, I gave the responsibility of IT over to finance. And then in the changing of the structure, we brought up two net, one was a network administrator and the other one, you know, is another like a systems administrator or communications administrator. And we made them coordinators so that they were not supervising people, but they were the subject matter experts. And the finance person was doing the supervision. So we tried that out and that worked really well. And then HR left. And then we said, okay, we'll give HR to operations, again, to be supervising, but to bring up HR staff to be the subject matter experts. Then, then the communications manager left and we gave that to the operations manager. Then um, uh, 
facilities left and we gave facilities to the operations manager. And then we moved over our courier to the operations manager. So currently our operations manager is overseeing HR, creative services, which is communication, courier, facilities, and then the admin staff that it takes to support that. Um, we also upgraded our public services manager to a deputy director position, um, libraries of this size, with 27 buildings and you know over 250 staff require a deputy. Um, so we upgraded that position. And uh, what am I missing? Hold on a minute. And then our um, collection services person uh, took, remained the same but she has brought great uh, modernity, so to speak, in terms of really heavily relying on technology uh, to be able to better deliver new resources. And that's taken her and her team three years. And as her team has uh, retired, um, you know, we look at every position that opens and we, um, I think she's lost, she, she, we did not fill five to six positions there. So since 2017, if you look at our 2020 budget that's available at trl.org, you will note that 20% of the staffing at the service at our headquarters has gone away because we have made you know, changes and we become, like I said, leaner, leaner, uh, a leaner organization. So I hope that wasn't too long an answer, Commissioner. Uh, but yeah, we're trying to we're bringing people up as subject matter experts and giving the supervision to the four directors who are left on the leadership team. One thing that's really hard is you, I'm sure you can imagine is uh, this isn't, we don't know your budget and stuff as, as well. This isn't our position. Uh, so it's a little hard for us to even look into it. You know, there was a lot of things that were called into question. There's, there's a lot of things that I wonder, but at the same time, I don't, you know, just being honest, I don't have the insight into all the things that you're doing. I, it, it's pretty hard for us uh, on the outside to step in and just know all that. Commissioner Trask, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to um, ask how that affected the budget, but you, um, I can take a look at the budget. I'll just go online and take a look at it and see how, see how that affected. Um, so it had to have been a, a good cost savings. And then, so I was just wondering that savings, did you push that on to um, was it kept at the administration administrative level or was that pushed out to other projects? That's a really great question. And so, um, so the, the, the short long answer is, is that when I became director in 2013, I think it was in 14 or 15 that the state auditor said to us, you need a beginning fund balance manage or beginning fund management policy. And we didn't have one. So we wrote one and the board adopted it and it was a very fiscally conservative um, policy, which means that, you know, we get paid by the taxpayers in November and then in April, May, late April, May, early May. So for those months in between, we need to make sure that we have enough money in the bank to pay our bills. And so it was fiscally conservative because it wasn't the first policy. And, you know, fast forward for four years or so, four or five years, and there's too much money in the beginning fund balance policy. So in the year of 2019, we gave the board three options to bring that percentage down. And they went for the middle percentage, which was 30%. And we talked about that easily three to four times throughout that year with them publicly. And by the end of that year, they, they approved the 30% unanimously, which freed up one time money of $4.9 million. And so they were very clear that they did not want that money to go towards um, salaries. They wanted it to go towards projects. And so that money has been put into the building fund because we do have special purpose funds. And the building fund now, we, we came up with three major concepts last August, which they approved as concepts and we're continuously working on them. So one of them was to provide a, library dem a popular library demonstration project at Capitol Mall in West Olympia, and also one in Hawks Prairie in Lacey. 
Fox Prairie had had a, what we call a kiosk at a coffee bike shop that shut down right before the pandemic. The board also, so that was about a little bit over a million, a million and $10,000 for those two projects with the bulk of that money going towards material physical items of popular, popular physical items in different formats for all ages. And then the second concept paper they approved was um, what we're calling, it's a, a coffee stand or library express stand that looks like a coffee stand. And we wanna put that in the Grand Mound area. So we're currently working on trying to find a location in that area. And that was budgeted for roughly, a well, for $100,000. And then the third concept paper they approved was uh, um, a half a million dollars for two food trucks and a large big truck for mobile services. And what we have discovered since then is that food trucks with their chassis is not good enough to withstand the the curving roads and the just the topography of the five county region. So we just met last week with our facilities committee saying that that's not going to work. Um, and we're looking now at two major trucks and the two major trucks are coming in a little bit more than a half a million. So the board will make that decision this week. I'm, I, I really do hope that they approve that because we will be reaching over 110 smaller towns, including many towns in Mason County that we're not reaching right now. Um, and so I really hope that that does get approved. We were told that the, the company, if, if they're award, you know, most companies right now are running really long term. I mean, just in terms of waiting for the delivery of trucks because there's just such a demand for them right, right now. So that's what, that's, that's, the, that's the beginning of the 4.9. You know, we are very admin light. As the board said, we were admin light when we were nine admin and myself. Well, now we're four admin and myself. So we're admin light. And um, um, we're, you know, we're, we have enough projects right now to keep us busy. And then we also want to see, um, you know, they're coming in a little bit higher, the money, right? I mean, the, the trucks and so on. So we just want to be very careful with the, with the 4.9 million. And then on top of that, um, we do rent out an older building in the Randall area for the Mountain View Timberland Library. And currently we're doing an engagement process with the community in East Lewis County to ask them what, what both users and non-users, what they would like to see in a library. So that those funds of the 4.9, some of those funds will need to go for some kind of library there in the future. Um, we're just got, we're at the point where we're gathering information right now. And so Back to the commissioner's question or comment about not knowing the budget, just to let you know that when I first started, we had a 310 actual people uh, working for us. And now we're about 251 people. And I, you know, there's a few that positions that we definitely need to, to fill. I mean, that's why I'm grateful that I still have the opportunity to be able to, um, you know, that we're in a soft hiring freeze, because as you know, you need to hire IT staff, you need to hire a finance director, you know, you need some core positions that still need to get budgeted. Um, so we're very, very careful and very mindful now about staffing levels. Sure, um, can, yes. Can I, can I ask uh, that you maybe send me uh, uh, your org chart from around 217, your org chart for, for what you're doing now and the minutes that showed that your board uh, approved those raises? Yeah. I'd appreciate that. That's Commissioners, do you have other questions uh, for now? I don't know. I don't. Cheryl, sure, we thank you for, for coming in. Uh, do you have anything last for us uh, before we move on to support services? I don't, I don't think so. I, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. See you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. All right, next up, uh, Frank, are you on there? I don't see, there he is. Good morning, Frank. Let's go ahead and move on to support services. Good morning, commissioners. Our first item is an agreement with the Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization and the prosecutor's office. And it's in regards to uh, involuntary treatment court. Tim, you wanna take over? Yeah, good morning and thanks. Thanks, Frank. Um, happy Monday to everybody. So I have a tap, you guys have the, amendment to the interlocal agreement that we signed last year 
with the Thurston Mason Behavior Health Administrative Service Organization. This is simply an amendment, basically just adds another year to what we've already had last year. Funding's all the same. You recently saw a nearly identical agreement um, that was passed for Superior Court. I'm assuming you'll see one soon for um, the clerk's office and the Office of Public Defense. There's no budget impact. It's the same amount as it was last year. Um, $50,000 for prosecute, prosecution services um, and staff services. And then there's another $10,000 for um, supplies and jury ex or trial expenses. Um, we've already included it in this year's budget. So like I said, there's no budget impact. Um, all of the other terms and conditions remain the same as to the original contract. You've seen them before. Uh, do you any questions? Not for me. Oh. Are you okay with putting everything on the agenda, guys? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, same here, Kim. Hey, that's easy enough. You guys are great. I appreciate it. All right. Appreciate Thank you. you. Have a good Monday. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Thanks, Tim. Um, next item is a public hearing scheduled for February 23rd to consider Fire District 16 annexation. Diane. So just a reminder, tomorrow's the hearing, and I've asked Auditor McGuire and Chief Wielander to attend to answer any questions. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> you waited there for nothing, Patty. <laughs> Story of his life. <laughs> Okay, so I've asked, and I asked them to attend the hearing tomorrow because I don't know what what might come from the hearing. Neither do we. So thank you. See you tomorrow. Good dry run, Patty. <laughs> Thanks. It was tough. I was gonna say you did a hell of a job. Good job. All right. What do we got next? Next is an ILA between the city of Shelton and the Shelton School District and Mason County in regards to the uh, skate park operations. Uh, Ross. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, been working on this since uh, 2020 uh, with uh, this with the city uh, with Mark Ziegler um, to update our our agreement we had, which originally was just an MOU with the city where we would pay the five thousand dollars a year and uh, for the skate park uh, maintenance and that they would do a lot of the maintenance itself and do all the uh, repairs. And uh, we have worked together on that. I have pointed out a couple of times some repairs that needed to be done and also some cleanup work that needed to be done, which they, they have done. And we're at a point now where we can, we need to make a choice on uh, remaining in this agreement with the city for the skate park are dissolving the skate park. Uh, that's our two choices that it seems like we have here at this point. Um, they have uh, provided us a ILA instead of an MOU, which has gone through Tim Whitehead and Tim's given it the, yep, that looks like an I, uh, ILA to him. And that's like, well, yes, it, it is. Um, but one of the things I'd like to uh, bring up, it, it's for another five years at this time. Um, that this is the only skate park that we have. This skate park is used quite quite a bit. Um, and its location obviously is right next to the Walmart store uh, that is actually on land that belongs to the school district, which they are also uh, part of this ILA, but they're a separate ILA between them and the city as far as uh, lease on the property for them to be using that property. But what I bring to you guys today is we, we've been in this for quite some time now, um, since 2014, I believe, uh, when they first moved the park over from where it was at. And uh, I'm just trying to kind of figure this out if we wanted to keep it going would be your choice. And if we decided not to, it would be a 50-50 with the city for us to dismantle it and to bring the grounds back to the way they they were originally uh, before the skate park went in. 
So that could be kind of pricey because I'm not sure of how much that would cost to get rid of all that stuff and to uh, bring that back to uh, back to its original. But I, I, I really want to see a personal feeling. I think we need to keep this skate park and actually we need to put in maybe another skate park up north would be a good idea. Uh, it is pretty well used. Uh, not only by skateboarders, but also bikes. They've been using bikes, which it's not technically made for, but they still have been able to use it. So uh, what I bring to you guys this morning is, uh, what is your opinion? Would you like to continue with this um, ILA with the, with the city for five years? Or would we want to look into something else as far as uh, dismantling it and and let me go to the side. I've been on this one for quite a while, some of the different, and I agree we need one up in the North Mason, but when we do, I hope we're smart enough to build out of concrete so that yeah. we don't have some of the same problems we've gone here. The This material has been, has, has been, there's been a lot of risk, a lot of uh, uh, financial upkeep that has gone with it over the years. And that's why uh, it had been moved to, to come off of our books. It's also located right directly in the city of Shelton. Uh, you know, there's, they have a parks district that was all in consideration when we were uh, deciding not to tear it down the, the last time. Uh, Ross, would you go over one more time the difference that they're asking for uh, regarding the uh, transferring of the skate park ramps? They, they have been already transferred. Those have been transferred uh, back originally in the original one in 14. Uh-huh. And those those now belong to actually the city of Shelton. The entire the entire thing belongs to the city of Shelton. Uh, we are just we're all we are going to be doing is paying the five thousand dollars to help with the maintenance. And the cost of 50-50. Uh, if, if, if we decide if we decide to uh, eliminate the skate park, it'll be a 50-50 between us and the city for dis uh, for uh, getting rid of the skate park itself and dismantling it and putting it back to the way it, way it was originally. Commissioners, comments, questions. I have a question, um, Ross. Have we has or have, has the county or the city approached the the why? to see if they would be interested in maybe adding this to their um, list of activities to do. I mean, they would be, they, I, because the why is there now, I think that they would be a good, um, that might be a good option to reach out to them because it, it needs improvement. Um, mm -hmm. I shop at Walmart frequently and it does need to be improved. And so if we could work, maybe, maybe the city, if the city could work with the Y, um, I'd like to keep it, absolutely keep it. But I, I do think that it could stand to be improved. So um, if you don't mind I'm asking the city or I could call Jeff. And no, ask that, that wouldn't be a problem because, uh, well, when we originally started doing this, the Y wasn't, mm -hmm. wasn't, up and running it was still in the idea right. stage originally and now that it is up there that could be someone that we could pull in with this um what i would like to do is i'll get a hold of mark and ask him uh we can still go through with this because it's gonna that five thousand that we give them mm -hmm. is not really going to touch what it really needs so there might be some other funding that we can get through the y that could help out and, and do we know, is the 5,000 going towards maintenance or is that, do, do they take a part of that for administrations? Administration? I know it's maintenance. Okay. Yes. I can tell you in the past, uh, before we transferred over, um, that was a low end on our maintenance, but we had, we had a lot that we, when I came in that we had to overcome on that. We had boards and those things are special panels. They're not cheap by a long shot. And when they start coming up, the liability was huge. That was my biggest concern the last time. Uh, you've got a, a situation where you have their places where they're connecting together. Can you think and picture a skateboard with a lip uh, while they're coming down? It is, it's it was a lot of temporary when it started. 
it's needed a lot of help. And that's one of the things when I went through with the, um, the parks advisory board, uh, we went through and did a parks tour with them. That was one of the places we went to. And after that tour, that's when I really actually got out and really looked at it and called Mark and said, look, we got to get a lot of stuff done over here. This mm -hmm. is, it wasn't safe. There was holes in the boards. There was all kinds of issues. And they did, they did get on it um, and did get those things fixed. But Randy is correct. That it's a special boards that you have to use. You can't have any kind of lips or anything on it or else it's going to take a toll. The liability and all the insurance and everything is on the city. Uh, according to this agreement, they, are, they put it underneath their insurance. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it still needs some work, though. It still needs work. And I've ridden a few skateboards in my life when I was a lot younger, but, um, and so I, I understand what a loose board can do, especially if you're using it as a ramp. Right. I've been around for, for the earliest half pipe. I was in California as a kid, I can assure you. I got a lot of scrapes on that. Before that, we just used the, uh, the ditches, the concrete ditches down there. So Kevin, uh, what are you thinking? Yeah, I think we need to. I think we need to keep it um, in some way, shape, or form. I, I don't. I don't have any issue with that part of it. It. It would be. It would be nice to see if there is a partnership with the Y. Um, you know, and 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 just sort of exploring that. Uh, I know uh, Kyle at the Y is very interested in doing a mountain bike uh, course uh, over that way. This might uh, ultimately, you know, make sense to to maybe include a, a skate park. Um, in that planning as well. And, and you don't know how married we are to this location for the skate park, but if there is a willing partner, um, you know, then it might make sense to, uh, you know, just build new, um, build appropriately um, and build, you know, for, for a more long lasting uh, structure than what we currently have uh, in place by the Walmart and then abandon this and, and, and clean it up um, down the road if there is that, if there is that willingness from the Y. So, I think in the interim, I'm, I'm fine kind of going through this and, and making some of those repairs and, and getting the agreement done. But I think long term, it makes sense to look for another partner. And if there are other similar projects that, that may be happening at the Y, this might be a good fit. Right. And it also gives us an opportunity to reach out to the legislature. Maybe this could be a capital budget project. Yeah. So now, Ross, I don't see anything that's much different than our MOU. Uh, what am I missing something here, or is this basically just uh, changing the heading? It um, there there a little bit of change is is just basically in the heading and the structure itself. Um, most of it is exactly the same. We have gone through it line by line with them, um, especially when it comes to the part about if we were going to uh, dissemble disassemble it, how that would work. We went through that. And then um, everything else is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. They just changed it into an ILA. Uh, originally, I believe it was an ILA, and then it went back to an MOU. And now their city attorney has said it'd be better to be an ILA. Uh, you, so we're, we're comfortable moving forward, commissioners? Is that what I understand? OK, Ross, next. Okay, thank you. And I will take that, uh, that'll be on, uh, oh, let me see, it's the, on 3-2 to bring it to you guys at your regular meeting March 2nd for, uh, for you guys to sign the contract on that. Thank you. Good. All righty. Next item is again, Ross, uh, Moving towards a dot gov domain. Okay, one second. Um, grab my next week paper here. Okay, um, what we're looking at here is um, <clears throat> we've been approached by um, by Patty McGuire uh, quite some time back, asking about our um, our website. I'm sorry, our web addresses because there was there were some issues with. Uh, some of the elections where people were getting some false information and some um, 
phishing and a few other things going on using a, uh, a, web, a web address on the end that is sort of like, like ours, which was a, a gov and a wa in, involved in it. And this is actually a very secured website, which is the dot, dot gov website. A lot of the other counties have gone to this website. Um, it offers us quite a bit of uh, security on this website. It, it is a um, it is one that we have to petition to to use as a government to use this website. There's actually a, a point of contact, the security control points, and everything on the last page that was given to you. That is sort of like a um, you have to get it notarized and the whole bit. So this is actually going to be if we decide to go with this. We would change our webs, our web address, and we would change our email addresses to change to a .gov at the end. And how long? Us, uh, how long could we keep our, our old addresses and have them forward over? One of the biggest problems I see when I look at this is the dangers involved with all these people that have our contact informations that uh, will be expected to move over and will not even have a clue that it needs to move over. But if we can have a situation where those other ones will still forward over for the next three years or so, then I think that takes away from some of the, the risk. Three years? Three years or so? Yeah, yeah several years. Uh, you know, and it doesn't cost that much more. You basically, when you own a website, uh, uh, you can have it forwarded to your, to your, you know, whatever address you put in the box. We would have to, uh, we'd have to retain for both, both of the addresses too. Yeah, except for it would go automatically into the other email address. You'll have so a. It ahead. could be just as easy to go ahead and set it up that if someone did send it to your old address, it would shoot them over to your new address. That's what I'm saying, that it forwards it automatically for the next several years. Right. And right. it's not hard to do, but you'll have to input it for every single one. Uh, but I think that's the safest. Other than that, you're going to have a lot of people trying to contact uh, many different departments, including the commission themselves that have our addresses that think they're communicating with us and they're not. Correct. And and there's there's a couple other things that go along with that. All of our stationery, all your business cards, everything like that would have to change because those would all have new new website addresses. But this the one nice thing about this, there is a a, a variety of security features that really do help us with security functions that uh, we do have a good safe system. We, we brought that to you already. Uh, TJ was in talking about our, our, uh, our safety that we got, our safety net we have in, but this is yet another one that can help us out a little bit more with it. Um, I kind of like this idea. It's not something that can be done like, boom, tomorrow we do it because it's going to take, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time to create it. The other nice thing is we can also have ours set up now that everybody's is the same. Instead of some people have three initials at mason.wa.us right now. Well, some people have their first name, period, their last name. Some of them just have a first letter in their last name. We can make it all uniform. So if you really wanted to get a hold of somebody here, you could do that. The state does it that way, where it makes it a lot easier if you're trying to locate somebody. If you know their name, you can you can figure out what their email address would be. Commissioners, I um I like I, I like this. Uh, I like thinking about it from the enhanced security perspective. I think that's a that's a big plus to it, as well as just kind of the streamlining of of the the emails. I I I do share and agree with Commissioner Netherlands concern. I don't know how long is the right amount of time to, to forward or, or whatever the, I mean, there might be some parameters on that just from a structural IT kind of perspective. But I, I do believe that the city had transitioned, Shelton had transitioned from using a ci.wa.us um, domain in the past couple of years. So it might be worthwhile reaching out to their IT, your, your IT counterpart over at the city and asking how they manage that transition and for how long there was forwarding and, and that kind of thing. But 
um, you know, just sort of on the on the surface of everything, I think it, it makes some sense in particular because of those security enhancements. And the cost has come down a little bit too on this one. Uh, it, it is down to like $400 for annual. That's not bad at all. Not bad at all. I think it was what $25 a month. Mm -hmm. Also, but I think I think it's a great idea. Um, it might stop Frank from asking for more, more money. <laughs> we received <laughs> some of our people received an, an email from Frank's Frank's email. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and so hopefully there are some some uh, security parameters around around that. And I do know that that elections. This would make it a lot easier for elections and a lot more secure for elections as well. Mm -hmm. So anything we can do to, to increase our security and keep our, our people safe. <laughs> I, I just received six of them from Karen Her, our past auditor, which yeah. was interesting. So, hey, uh, just so you know, I have, you know, from the different businesses I have and, and, and or I've had over the years, uh, I still have some websites that still exist. I still have, uh, I don't use them, but the people do. They still send me emails through them and I haven't touched the forwarding in maybe four or five years, six years, eight years for some, and it still works just fine and forwards them over. So, you know, I think uh, I would hate to cut anything short. The question I have is what do we pay now for our, for our uh, .us? Because that's gotta be some cost with it. Because that you have to be able to keep that, that, that .us original address to be able to have the email addresses still. So there is a, a cost for keep continuing to keep it. Do you know how much it is? I do not know what that is, but I can find out what that dollar is now. Please, because yeah. I would like to continue it on. I think you should continue it for at least several years because there's a lot of other people, a lot of things. And if it's not going to be a cost, a heavy cost, it's just a safety mechanism. And, and it goes right into your, your, your regular email. So you don't even know the difference unless you look into the details to find out it was sent to a different place. Right. And if I add to that, one of the features that are available are the forwarding options. There's also an auto reply. Yeah. So that you receive an email on your old uh, address and auto reply back and say, my email has changed to yada, yada, yada. And that way they are more, um, they're informed that you've moved on to a .gov server. Right, that they can change it, but it still will send it to you. It'll still yeah. send you that email. Right. But they also get that notification, so right. that would. And it gives us time to spread it out. So personally, I'm in favor as long as we take those safety precautions and, and keep uh, continuity for the next several years. I don't see where there's any risk, and uh, it just strengthens things. That's my personal opinion. I would like to go back from the city um, just to see how long they kept their old addresses. And, you know, maybe other counties have also done it. I know that, that um, they've switched over. To the dot gov so it might be worth reaching out to some of the other counties that have done this also okay okay not a problem at all not a problem and i'll bring this back to you guys i didn't i did not send this or set this up for any kind of uh meeting or anything yet just as a discussion and i'll get that information back for you guys okay. mr shooty you're comfortable also yeah no i think that's good thank you all right next Thank you, Ross. Uh, the next item I'd like to pull, um, I had received some verbal conversation around one of the board members for the Housing Authority um, of resigning. I have not received anything in writing, so I'm postponing this until I receive something in writing. Okay. Uh, last item is the process timeline for replacement of my position. And I've drafted a short, um, a briefing item to discuss the different components of the timeline. Um, and these are obviously all just proposed dates and times, but um, between March 1st and 15th, if the board would like to review and revisit the job description, we can do that and possibly rewrite the job description or reorganize the control and the scope of work that this, uh, this position manages. I myself, I would like to, to see us move forward with that, but I'd like to see us do some changes. Uh, some of the, the things I'd like to see us consider is separating out uh, uh, HR 
and creating a position there uh, that would manage uh, HR for the most part, uh, separate from support services. Okay. And then some addition in, in duties, but for the most part, those duties have always been done there anyway, but maybe we can put them in writing. Commissioner Schutte? Yeah, so um, Frank, I appreciate the timeline here. I think uh, I think it's a it's a good start. Obviously, it's a big it's a big transition. So there's a lot to consider. Um, as we consider the job description and what we want that to look like, um, you know, I, I have uh, in the past been supportive of uh, looking at transitioning to a county manager or county administrator position. I think as things get uh, more complex, um, you know, that uh, it, there needs to be some continuity there. Uh, in terms of, of those um, particular elements of an administrator position. Um, so if, you know, if we are to go the route of continuing with support services and, and making some additions and subtractions to that job description, I'd like to see some county manager administrator uh, job descriptions to see what from there might make sense to incorporate into the, into the support services um, job description, especially uh, since uh, there seems to be, um, you know, the potential to move HR out of uh, the purview of support uh, services and, and have that be a standalone type of position. Um, there's going to be a gap there that we would need to fill. And so I'd like to have a little bit more information on, um, you know, just what we can fold into there to make it uh, make it make sense, um, you know, along those lines, um, just to uh, just to add add some elements of it um, that are that are similar. Mm -hmm. um, in, in looking at the HR, how administrative does that um, change need to be? Are we talking um, a director position? Are we talking an administrator? What I personally am thinking administrator. I, I want to you know, be careful with, with throwing the word directors around. But an administrator, I would think it would have to have a very high level of uh, qualification education. Um, you know, a, an absolute uh, standalone, except for they would answer to the commission. I want to make that clear. But a standalone uh, position separate from any direct, any other directors or administrators. So they can keep their sovereignty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, yeah. and the... Support Services Director keeps its independence um, from the HR responsibilities. Yes, Kevin, you were saying something. Yeah, I was just going to say, kind of along those lines. I think you know, as we look at our at our three directors into the current organizational structure, um, you know, the Support Services Director. I think there's a there's an inequity there uh, in you know, between the other two, where uh, you know, no matter what personnel decisions or or you know, along those lines, HR related decisions they have to make, it, it all ends up getting vetted through um, support services because that remains under that, under that purview. And so, you know, the, the support services director, whoever it is going forward, um, you know, in its current form, it's, uh, it's, you know, the first among equals, so to speak. Um, and it's just, I think, I think there's a way that there, there may be a way for us to look at it where, um, you know, that that isn't happening and there's some autonomy for HR to make make decisions and work directly with the commission so as to not be disruptive to the uh, the three directors that we have in our structure currently. I would agree. Commissioner Trask? Yeah, I, I would agree too. And I think that there are some changes that we can um, make to make the new, um, the new Frank, so to speak. Um, position, oh, how do I want to say this? Um, so that the, that it works as a solid, not not that it's not working now, Frank, but I think that there could be some changes um, as far as maybe looking at also like a, 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 a budget manager or things like that, because I do think that there's some, there's some need in, in other areas. So if we're doing, if we're making a change, maybe that's something that we should look into now and get that in, um, get in, get that in place before um, we make one big decision or okay. two big decisions. So, I, uh, Commissioner Schutte, I heard you mentioned you wanted to look at.
job descriptions for county administrator manager. Um, I'll forward those to each of the commissioners as well as job descriptions for something similar to a support services director. And then again, job descriptions for something for an HR um, administrator. And um, then we can uh, discuss at the next briefing the pros and cons of each and start developing a, um, a revision to the job description um, and the organizational scope. Which one has the beautiful chimes? I'm just like in the background here. Is that yours? Uh, Frank, you should have said, I don't hear any chimes. Yeah. <laughs> so Frank, have you gotten the uh, direction that you were looking for so far with this? Is there something? Yeah, yeah. then the other one, um, as far as direction is concerned, are we looking to place this as a um, internal, um, local, regional, Nationwide, do we want to put it out uh, with a agency? Do we want to keep it um, within our um, the scope of what we normally or have in the past done, which is to say we put it in a couple of the local Olympia, Tacoma papers, and Seattle, possibly? Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to consider going through an entity to make sure that we can keep a good arm's length uh, transaction through some of this in the vetting. Yeah, I think um, obviously, obviously have it be open internally. Um, you know, I think if there are internal candidates that are interested, you know, making sure they have the opportunity to compete for it, I think is 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 great. Um, but I would like to get a little bit more information on costs and process uh, around. A, you know, a, I'll use Prothman just as the example. I think they're the they're the one that most rely on. Um, you know, here in our state, but. You know a profman like organization to to go through that i'd like to know what the costs are and so we can factor that in to just you know how we would promote the position more broadly okay i'll have that again for our next briefing commissioner trask did you have anything you want to add on that i just want to make sure that, that the cost is definitely looked at i i think i wouldn't want to just stay internal but i think that we should give others the opportunity as well Does that answer your question, Frank? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. I'll be back next week with additional information. Do you have other issues? Nope. Uh, then we have commissioner discussion. Okay. I think the first one was, uh, was that the Gorse Coalition? Yes. Okay. So in your packet, or you don't have packets on your computer, you have the breakdown on that. Uh, uh, I, we have uh, already voted in the past and including the budget uh, money for doing this, but this is the actual memorandum of understanding uh, to come before us. I understand that uh, that that Commissioner Schutte had some ideas and things he'd like uh, to be inputted. Would you mind sharing that with us, Commissioner? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Commissioner. So um, just one of the things that I think is important, um, you know, especially as we start to do more and more regional partnership type planning and, and work, uh, is just I, I submitted to Frank, and I think he distributed it to you late last week, a uh, resolution talking about our other regional partnerships and the efforts that we're making, uh, in particular in North Mason, to provide context to the public um, as to why something like this is important and um, why we're making this kind of investment and who we're working with and why we're working with them and, and that kind of thing. So, um, Commissioners, I don't know if you've had a chance to review that or if you need a little bit more time or... Yeah, I'd like some more. I, I don't, I didn't see that. So maybe Frank, you can make sure to resend that to me. Are you still on Frank? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, please, please resend that to me. I have no problem with moving forward with it because I, I like the idea of it. I just don't know what it looks like. I'd like to see it. Absolutely. I will resend it uh, as soon as we're off. Thank you. I took a look at it and um, I like it. I but as soon as Randy takes a look at it, I would, you know, like to move forward with it. I have no problem with moving forward with it now. And if I have objection, I'll let it be known at the time. Uh, it, Cause it makes sense to me. Uh, if anything, it's going to be just a word here, word there, because, uh, you know, it, it makes the, the concept of it makes sense. 
Yeah, so maybe, um, you know, we could just revisit. We have, we're briefing again next Monday. Let's revisit it, and then we can we can add it all up on Tuesday. Will that uh, uh, interfere with moving forward on the memorandum of understanding in any way right now? Well, I, no, not necessarily. I mean, let's, you know, I, we can move the MOU forward, and if there are any issues, we can address it next Monday in briefing and and move that forward as well. Okay, so yeah. we'll put this on for, for Tuesday and we'll also look at the other uh, uh, for Monday. They're looking at Tuesday the 30th. Oh, uh, there's no 30 days in February, Commissioner. Oh my goodness, I was looking <laughs> at March. Wow. Huh. That's March 2nd. <laughs> it's the next commission meeting. The second. Do we have a briefing on Monday the 1st? I believe that's canceled. Diane, can you? Was it canceled? I thought she said. Yes, it was canceled. Oh, it's canceled. Yeah, that's the one that um, the Y is having their grand opening that morning. That's so right. We don't have streaming services. We you know, uh, Kevin, if it's okay with you, I will have somebody, he'll get me this copy. I'll get it and I'll try to view it before we even get off of our meeting today. Sure. Uh, let's move forward with putting this on the agenda for tomorrow then if, if you have no issue with that. And I don't see any issue on that paperwork. Are you comfortable? Well, well mean, we have a meeting we're, we're on the second. Next, we're, we're still meeting next Tuesday. Okay, so no. I don't need to have the briefing. If I can see it today, I'll let you know by the yeah. end of today, though. So we're comfortable with that then. For March 2nd? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, he'll send it over to me. I'll look at it real quick and okay. just see if there's any. I'll send it over here in just a few minutes. Okay. Another question that came up is the use of our logo. Personally, I mean, I think if we adopt the MOU, I don't have an issue with our logo being used. I think that probably comes along with adopting the MOU. Right, and I, I think that, you know, if we do give them permission to use our MOU or our logo, um, we need to consider that if other people would want it as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, and traditional commissioners, we have allowed that when we, jointly send something out. And I know in particular, we do it with the tribes yeah. and then we send them our logo and it all comes on whatever correspondence. Okay, so Kevin, uh, letter of support, uh, City Shelton. Yeah, so a uh, couple of weeks ago, I guess at our January meeting of the Housing and Behavioral Health Advisory Board, um, that group recommended that the county commissioners send a letter to the city regarding um, the workforce housing project that's being discussed um, the draft letter that you have in front of you um, acknowledges that it's a request from the Housing uh, and Behavioral Health Advisory Board. Um, uh, talks about the county's previous support of workforce housing development, uh, which uh, I think in 20, 2019, I believe we, we signed a letter of support um, for pursuing these types of projects. Um, and then it also talks about uh, the need for the city to work with the county on planning uh, because this will, uh, in its current proposal form, would impact the unincorporated UGA, um, in particular, uh, the uh, Island Lake community and some of the surrounding uh, areas there, um, in particular from environmental and transportation perspectives. And so um, the, letter, the letter basically says, we're supportive of the conversation, we're supportive of the city going through this initial phase uh, of looking at the project, but that we want to make sure that uh, city staff um, and the council is working with both our staff and the commission on um, developing this project and other workforce and affordable housing opportunities. So I have to say first, um, sorry, I'm jumping in Randy, um, that I'm disappointed in the city um, because they have not reached out to the county yet. Not once did they give me a call. I don't know that they called um, anyone else about this project, but I was I was um, I was approached at a gas station asking if I supported it, and I knew nothing about it. And so, and and you know, this could be on me too because I've not been watching their meetings like I should. But I was disappointed that they didn't reach out and and talk to me about it. I do have concerns about the plans that I have heard. Um, I've, I've seen nothing in, in writing and that again, you know, I should be doing my a little bit more research. But um, at this point in time, I, 
I don't know that I support it. Um, you know, there's some critical land there. I asked them if they did a SEPA and NEPA. They've not done that yet. There are things that I think that they should have done before they um, went as went as far as they have gone. And so I don't I don't know that I could support this yet. I would want a little bit more information. Uh, what, Kevin, uh, your your timeline and necessity. So if, if there's more information that that you all want, that's that's fine. It, I'm you know I'm bringing the message back from the Housing and, um, and Behavioral Health Advisory Board. Um, I did draft the letter um, on their behalf, um, but I you know if there's a if there's a conversation that you all want to have with the city, I encourage you to do that. Um, so I, I I don't have a particular timeline in mind. I think they're voting uh, on this at some point in April. Um, so that, you know, just use that maybe as your own frame of reference for doing your own, you know, conversations and research on it. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think that's probably up to each of you to, to figure out how you want to approach that. Um, the only thing that I would just say is, you know, I, I, I look at this as an opportunity for us to say we, we want to be involved in the planning process. Um, you know, so if nothing else, keep that in mind as well. Uh, you know, just from our perspective, obviously, um, you know, Commissioner Trask doesn't sound like uh, they've reached out to you or our staff uh, as of yet um, on that. And so, um, you know, this certainly would help send that up the flagpole. But if uh, if you want to have more conversations with them and, and then we could revisit this in two weeks when we're back in briefing, that's fine. Um, you all let me know. I'm just I'm just bringing this forward. Yeah, if you could give me give me two weeks. Um, and then bring it right back at the briefing. And you know that, uh, you know, I, this is your district commissioner, so you know where I'm going to fall on that. Uh, uh, I'd be more than happy to support uh, the extra time that's needed for you to make your decision there. So uh, are we done with that one? Yep. Okay, I want you to know I just read uh, what was just sent to me, and I absolutely 100% disagree with this. Okay. There's no way I, I, I could be in support of this. This is a conflating of many different issues, many different things that are happening onto something that, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here with uh, the Gorse Coalition. Okay. What in particular, Commissioner? Every part of it. Uh, this, this has nothing to do with the, the bypass. This has nothing to do with uh, the sewering of, uh, and the extension up there. Of that, I can assure you we're going to have, as that goes forward, uh, there's going to be some serious issues that come forward with that stuff. There's just so much of this that have nothing to do with it. I appreciate that we want to get that information out, but that has no connection with us supporting this organization to move forward and getting funding for this specific project, just like we wouldn't do a letter like that for every other project that we've done. We do a lot of projects all the time, and I think that this is uh, not appropriate to conflate them so much. Why well, I, I have to disagree with you on that. I think um, I understand what you're saying, but I disagree with it. Um, I think it's important that if we're going to participate in regional organizations, that there is uh, there's context around that. And certainly, certainly, what we're doing up there with all of these projects ties into this. I don't know that one would be happening without the other. And I think we're sending we're sending money and sending you. To these meetings and so I think it's important for that group to also know um, what's happening on our side of the county line. Yeah and you're more than welcome to talk to them or tell them about it but you shouldn't be putting it in, in an official uh, resolution. That's that doesn't even make sense and you know there's been words for the one million but we haven't received the one million. There's a lot of stuff that's going on that is being assumed in here that's not happening. Such as? So, as I just said the million uh, you don't think that's been pledged? I don't think it's been followed through with the original pledge. I don't think there's been any anything when it comes to design for that anymore. And originally when that was set up to be pledged, that was with the idea that we connected to the port and we we're going to get those ERUs. Now we're not even talking about any of that. Uh, there's so many, there's so much to this. And I think this is more of an attempt to to push forward that other agenda than it is to work together on this one. These are two separate issues. I'd like this to, to focus on whether or not we're going to work with the Gorse Coalition to help get funding for the infrastructure of that, uh, that uh, fixing that road and, and that intersection up there on the top. 
uh, instead of bringing in all these other issues that have nothing to do with that intersection or the anything they're going to discuss or talk about or anything there. Yeah, again, I just I completely disagree. I think working in regional partnerships, it's important to have that acknowledgement of all the regional things that we're doing. They're all connected. Um, whether you you see that or not, or agree with that or not, I can't I can't speak to that. But uh, there's very little benefit to Mason County with just having improvements to Gorst without having the acknowledgement and the work done in Mason County as well. Those people we're dealing with on that committee have nothing to do with any of these things you're talking about here. There's a few that that we touch with them, but that has nothing to do with the Gorst Coalition or anything we're doing. Again, I think it's a reach. And again, it's not just about the Gorse Coalition, okay? It's about letting our community know what we're working on and why that makes sense to continue to work with the Gorse Coalition. It's, it's all complimentary. It's not one or the other. These are things that are happening. These are things that we've all been working on. And it makes more sense when you look at the big picture to have that context for why, why we're sending you why we're sending money particularly uh you know maybe over a few years of time up there if we're not going to make these improvements regionally then um you know really i mean what else are we doing right i see this as as an investment in in mason county's future it's it's, it's not obviously there, there's talk at the state level as doing things regionally as well and so I don't know, I just I just see this as as a step forward to working better as a group, showing that we've got an interest in um, all of Mason County, including our neighbors, where we will be. I mean, obviously, I go through Gorst all the time when I'm going to Bremerton. And so it it does affect the residents of Mason County, um, those riding the the bus to the the, the shipyard. So all of this, I think, is has an impact on Mason County and our neighbors. So I don't know. I see the the resolution as as a, a step forward, trying trying to unite and and progress. Again, Commissioner, I you know everything you said, I agree with except for that last part. This resolution has nothing to do with that. But I, I agree with everything you had said about that, because this is a partnership. This is a benefit to Mason County. This project would definitely have a huge impact on Mason County if it gets fixed. Uh, there's no there's no doubt of that. And that's why we should be involved. And that's why we are involved. Uh, it's a bottleneck that uh, opens it up for the community. It is just the idea that we're going to try and throw all this stuff into it. Uh, that has nothing to do with with the project that's at, at hand. This is a this is a political move to try and get this stuff back out again, and that's fine. And if we're going to continue that way, I assure you, we will get the information out. I have no doubt about that because there's going to be a lot of more, more information that'll be coming about it. But that's what this this particular resolution that we put forward is is not in regards to the MOU. This is in regards to a lot of other stuff. So it's in regards to why we participate in regional planning efforts. Okay. Absolutely, well, absolutely. Yeah. Road and utility infrastructure projects that have a regional significance, like the freight corridor, like transit, like when we send when we when we invest in a roundabout on State Route Three, so that we could put a park and ride in Belfair, so that our folks that work at the shipyard have a way to get there and reduce congestion. Like when we do investments in roads like connector roads to the freight corridor so that we provide for additional mobility. These things are all regionally significant as, as the Gorse Coalition may be. And as, so, as we have when we did our, our infrastructure changes at Camilchi, as we have when we've done uh, looking for new infrastructure changes for Johns Prairie, you're right. It can all be considered connected if on a stretch, but that's not what we're talking about. This Gorst uh, intersection and interchange has nothing to do with any of the things you're talking about here. And that's not well, what- Why are we doing it? What do you if, mean? I mean it op why, it do, opens why do any of this, Commissioner? It, it opens up uh, the transportation into Mason County and stops the bottleneck. That's the real purpose behind it. All this stuff that's added in here is not anything to do with 
why we're there and what we're doing. Isn't that what the freight yeah. corridor does? Isn't that what the freight corridor yeah. does? And, and, the and, when we were does? and when we were talking about the freight corridor, that made sense to talk about the freight corridor. We were talking about Camilchi and doing the improvements of Camilchi. It made sense to talk about the improvements at Camilchi. But again, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to move forward. And it, you know, it it only takes two to move it forward. I've made my my point clear, and I can assure you, you know, I see what this is, and I see where we're going with it. We're going to end up having these discussions later. But as for now, on this one, I'll go ahead. If uh, uh, two commissioners say we move it forward, we move it forward, and then we'll vote and we'll we'll deal with it then. I'm kind of disappointed, honestly, that you see this as political. I do not at all see this as political. I see it as an improvement and working as a team. No, I, 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 I see the project that same way. It's, it's the verbiage in this, in the resolution that was just sent to me that uh, Commissioner Schutte had uh, added to all of it. Instead of just you know accepting this this uh, memorandum of understanding or entering into agreement with the memorandum of understanding, there's a whole lot more that's put into this to 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 change it basically to add a bunch of other stuff to it, and that's fine. Like I said, uh, we can move forward with it. I'm just gonna you know I have my vote. This is my community. And I know my community, and I can tell you uh, we're getting ready to go down a path that this is not. In all the years I've been here, I have never. I have never done what, I, you know, the public battle that I'm going to probably end up doing on all this. And I can see where it's going. And that's fine. But like well, I said, let's, uh, let's, Commissioner, let's talk about that a little bit because I, I don't understand. I honestly don't understand what in that resolution is so problematic from a, from a, you're talking about public battles and you're talking about political warfare or whatever. I mean, it just seems like a really overblown response to a list of, ser of a, a series of projects that, that we've all been working on for a number of years, some even before I got here. Mm -hmm. As I said, it's, it's the idea, uh, th this stuff has nothing to do with, you know, it's a stretch to say that it should ever be in a resolution regarding the memorandum of understanding that we're doing right now. And again, I'm, uh, we don't have to fight this this now. We're going to deal with it when we come to the other parts. Uh, other parts. I, I hate I hate even I hate even being like this because literally uh, I've avoided it all these years. But this these next phases that this is setting up for uh, is going to be a battle that you know I'm disappointed that we have to have, especially since again, you know we got other things that are coming up. We'll be talking about today. I know my community uh, that they select this from the different parts so that we would uh, have a clear understanding of what we need and where we're going and what we're doing. Uh, I know I try to always support you in your guys' districts um, and we'll deal with this other part as we come forward. But again, on this one, if you agree to move it forward, we move it forward. And that's, it's just that simple. I'm one vote. I'm not, I'm not, uh, all it takes is two to move it forward. You know, I, I would rather just see a, an acceptance of the memorandum of understanding like we do with every other project, every other memorandum of understanding that we enter into. We're going to do an interlocal agreement here on the, with the, the uh, city of Shelton. We're not going to have a big list of stuff like this for everything we've ever done with the city of Shelton in that uh, interlocal agreement, and we wouldn't have for a memorandum of understanding either. Uh, every other memorandum of understanding we've done in the last so many years it doesn't have anything like this. This is... Something I think for me, sorry. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I think for me, the difference is this is not in Mason County. And and so for me, it's it, it's regional. It's not just I mean Shelton's in Mason County. So so those are those are easier for me to understand. Um it, in fact when uh when Gorse came before me, I was confused as to why um something in another county was coming to Mason County and it was, it was, you know, a, a, a big deal. So honestly, I'm, I was supporting Gorse because you wanted it. Yep. And, but I still, I, I still have a hard time, honestly, saying that I support it a hundred percent. No, and I, and, and you're allowed to do that. And I understand that. Uh, and I have, 
I'm not questioning your support for the Gorse Coalition uh, memorandum of understanding. That's not that's not where I'm at. Eventually, we're going to have the same conversation, or somebody will have that same conversation with the overpass going towards Olympia, and that bottleneck will have to be cleared up. And it's not in Mason County either. That's just the way we have to do things. Uh, but that has nothing to do with this all the verbiage in this memorandum of understanding agreement here that we don't do for any other project and haven't done for any other project ever in the past. Uh, this is this is something uh, new and interesting. So again. Well, Commissioner, how about this? Uh, you know, I, I appreciate your feedback on it. I will make it clear. I'm, I'm, I 100% disagree with your perspective on it. I think, I think it's a, a restating of, of votes that we've already taken uh, in, in, uh, in a number of capacities. Um, but if, you know, if, if you give me a little bit of time to think about it, uh, maybe let's revisit the MOU, um, and, and this, let me think about how, uh, how we can maybe figure this out. Okay. So I, would, I, would, I would ask that we table the MOU. Okay. Uh, until our next, uh, briefing. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Trask, are you? I agree with that. Okay. Frank, do you have anything else for us? Is there any other commissioner discussion? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, then let's go ahead and move right into uh, Pack Mountain Workforce. I saw her here a minute ago. Yep, she's here. Commissioner. Good morning, commissioners. Well, Good morning. Pack Mountain Workforce Development Council, thank you so much for taking just a brief amount of time with me this morning. Um, given it looks like your agenda is really packed, maybe what we could do is um, if I can give you, most of you know uh, Pack Mountain Workforce Council. You're one of the few of our five commissions where all of the commissioners are the commission that, you know, the, that we've been working with for um, the last number of years. So telling you about Pack Mountain is really not necessary. Um, I thought, though, that it would be good for you to see some of the materials we've developed. And then, most importantly, I'd like a, just a, a little bit of time to hear you say what you um, might be interested in the, in the next year. Before I proceed forward, um, I wanted to acknowledge that um, here with me today, um, because they've been on, looks like Jennifer Beria from the EDC, she is our uh, board member. She's your appointed board member, um, but she's on the agenda later in the day. Jacqueline Early is our board chair. She has led our um, uh, board admirably for the last year and will again in the upcoming year. Your third, and of course, you know her from Sierra Pacific. Your third board member is Derek Epps. Um, Derek is from Seattle Shellfish. Um, and uh, Derek has, is also a member of our executive finance committee along with um, our board officers. So Mason County is incredibly well represented on the Workforce Council. Um, what I'd like to do, I'll, I'll shrink my presentation and then that way we, if everybody shrinks a little bit, maybe um, that'll uh, enable all of the other presenters to be accommodated. Can I share my screen? Does that... Will, will that work, Diane? Um, yeah, we need to go into the chambers just a minute. That's where the, there we go. Somebody oh, there we go. Here. Yeah, can you see it? Yes. Yeah, oh, yes. Excellent, good, good. Um, so every year the council prepares something called a workforce um, a regional impact report. And so those are kind of like your annual reports, but they're, you know, if you wanted to see our budget, if you wanted to see all of that, we can certainly give you that. But this is more storytelling about who we are and what we do in the, in the Workforce Council. So this is for 2020. Obviously, it was a dramatic year. I saw on your agenda that you had a COVID um, briefing earlier, so no one needs to tell you about the trauma drama of um, 2020. We're rolling into 2021 with a lot more hope. Um, so this is just a reflection backward uh, and then a, a way to inform you maybe on some data and um, a little bit of tidbits about what we do so that you could follow up with, um, with me, um, with any of my staff, if you wanted to drill down a little bit further, if you had any specific questions. 
I will be sending this impact report out to you. Um, you can find it on our website at www.packmountain.org um, under regional sectors, and we've broken them all up by county, these impact reports. So um, just as a reminder, there are five counties represented in Pack Mountain Workforce Council. Um, what we do is to provide workforce solutions. And we do that for a dual customer, our businesses, which is why our boards are business led. That's why people like Jacqueline Early lead our board. That's why we have subject matter experts like Jennifer Barria and Derek Epps on the board because the board needs to be private industry led. 51% um, um, of our membership must be that. The other are federally designated through federal law, the WIOA law, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Um, and WIOA law um, it calls out specific other seats. So you get um, K-12, you get higher education, of course, employment security, um, DBR. So you've got 11 of those other seats, but there are 15 private um, board seats. Um, and on the back side of this report, you'll see that we source all of our leadership from deep in the community. Each of the communities is very well represented. Many folks know our work through WorkSource, and that's a primary outlet for most workforce development councils. There are 12 of us around the state, workforce development councils. Pack Mountain is one of the largest, like the second largest of the 12 in land area. And we are the second largest with the, name, with the number of counties. Eastern Washington Partnership has nine counties. We have five counties. Some of the re regions have just a single county. King County, Snohomish County, Spokane County. Um, they, they're pierced, right? But we had to... Um, because of the population we needed to group. And it works. Um, Jennifer will tell you that she and her colleagues have worked together for many years because there's quite a bit of similarities in how the economies work. And then of course, the labor base and how people who are looking for jobs and um, have jobs go into these other counties. So at WorkSource, we're helping job seekers and businesses we work with youth. Um, we have a specific, this area here talks about some of our um, high priority, and we call those high priority dislocated workers, um, people who are um, coming out of military service, our veterans, right? Um, people with disability. Those are groups of people that we consider high priority, and we dedicate specific dollars to that. Um, those, those dollars then help us design programming that allows people to get to the world of work, to attach to the labor market so that they can find their own prosperity, but also so that they can be contributors to the local economy, right? So that their communities can benefit. Um, obviously the pandemic was pretty dramatic. We pivoted pretty um, uh, immediately when um, services began to shut down. So work, source, while the building has been closed, we continue to provide services. Now, I want to do a little bit of distinguishing because um, sometimes people see work source as the unemployment office and where um, you go to get UI, right? That's not, that's the old unemployment office and those went away in 1998. It's still, people still think about that. We are the re-employment and training offices. And so those offices have remained open virtually and we're getting ready to do um, more face-to-face uh, -face kinds of services in the next number of weeks, person to person. Still appointment because the buildings are not completely open, but we know that some folks are challenged to be able to get the services that they need um, when, when they can't get into, maybe they don't have technology at their house or maybe the broadband's inadequate, right? So there we are, there's our WorkSource logo, um, incredible partnerships uh, represented in WorkSource. Um, as I mentioned, K-12, our community colleges, our economic development partners, and then of course our businesses who are trying to design the right workforce solution for the region. 
numbers tell part of the story, but we also think it's important that you hear how people's individual lives are um, impacted. So when you get this report, you'll see there's some um, stories of how the work we've done has changed and impacted people's lives. Um, and we see that as particularly important when we think about youth. Um, they are, it seems trite to say it, but it's just so true that they are our future and we've got to figure out how. It has always been true, but in the, in the pandemic, it is dramatically true that we need to um, do more to make sure that they can get connected to the labor market. Um, here's that commitment to business, our business impact story, plus the number of um, businesses that have been served. Uh, you see that through our business services teams. We contract for those services with the Thurston Chamber. They work very closely with all the local chambers to make sure that those services are delivered in a way that serves those local communities. Um, there are six primary sectors in Pack Mountain region. Uh, uh, Dwayne Evans was our board chair prior to Jacqueline Early. He came out of Port Blakely communities right there, right? Jacqueline from out of Sierra Pacific. Wood products and paper manufacturing, huge still for our region. These are good jobs. There aren't as many of them as there used as they used to be, but Jacqueline will tell you that she is constantly searching for, in particular, those millwrights, um, those uh, sort of mid technician uh, who are Jack and Jill of all of all aspects of how to run a um, manufacturing plant. Uh, healthcare in across the state. Healthcare is a primary sector that we want to pay, pay attention to. Specialty manufacturing and logistics. IT and telecom and hospitality and tourism. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about in Mason County and you um, probably have, or I can send you most recent, these came out of November because they're in our impact report. So we stopped calculating at a, at a point in time, but monthly we run these numbers um, and can get Jack or, um, uh, Jennifer um, has access to this information and she probably is going to provide you some of those things. I won't steal your thunder, uh, Jennifer, but um, some of the most updated information. Um, and in terms of unemployment, you'll see that the people who have been the most impacted are coming out of, these are the top five industries, construction, healthcare, retail trade, accommodation and food services, arts and entertainment. And it's interesting to note um, I've done this presentation three, four different times now. Um, this is the fourth time. And um, often accommodation and food services is at the top and construction is um, more at the uh, number four or number five. And uh, I think it is probably due to your community really coming together um, and trying to make sure that accommodation and food services that to the extent possible by local um, those small restaurants, those small businesses, that matters to them because their margins are so, so thin. So there were jobs that were lost, absolutely, unequivocally, but not as much as in construction. Um, you see, this is your, um, your employment. Back in January of 2020, there were just under 25,000 um, employed people, um, jobs that were in uh, Mason County. We're now down to just under 22,000. So obviously we shed some jobs and that is, that is uh, disconcerting, right? The unemployment rate, it peaked at 16% back in April when everything was shut down. And here we are in November at 8-7 and Jennifer will probably be able to tell you about this and where we are currently. We think we're trending down a little bit, but it is still, these are numbers of people that are searching for work and who are eligible to work. Um, it doesn't account for, these numbers do not account for people who've given up um, people who have just said, you know what, I'm just going to hold, stay this one out. Um, these are what's called U3 numbers and U6 numbers, you know, you can probably double and then back off a few percentage points 
to give you a sense. So if you, if back in November, we were using that kind of calculation, we might be somewhere around still 15% of real, it, it's a more accurate reflection of who is not working. Um, let's see, uh, we've talked before about commute patterns and the fact that uh, you're located so close to um, uh, the state offices, many of your folks are leaving the actual county boundaries to go to find work elsewhere. And a number of different uh, reasons for that, where are the jobs um, and you know, people like living perhaps uh, more out of the um, uh, semi-urban area in a, in a more uh, rural situation, but they've got to be able to find jobs that are family wage. And so they're looking elsewhere for that. So that is one of the things that I know um, the economic development uh, directors are all talking about because this is not uncommon in, in our rural areas. Um, I show the Pac Mountain WDEA as a whole just to give some comparisons, um, you see that the, um, there it is, that food accommodation, food services and accommodation, the number one loser, shedder of um, jobs, um, but you still see construction, you see healthcare, and you see retail trade. So you're, you're right in there with the rest of how the, the larger region is operating. There's our, um, as a, a the, the five counties together, what our numbers look like. Uh, this, uh, telling you governance, just because I want you to know, you, you, I've introduced your um, locally appointed um, uh, board members, but it's also important to recognize the rest of the other board because the board comes together to think about this as a region and how we can do things in a way that um, leverages and maximizes and provides for all of the counties and all of the individuals in our region. So um, you see our, our leaders here, Jacqueline Early, Vice Chairperson Michael Cade from Thurston County, Alyssa Shea from Grace um, Harbor Port, um, the consortium chair who is our elected official um, group, uh, Commissioner Trask serves on that group, and the leader of that group is Commissioner Lisa Olson from Pacific County. Steve Rogers from Pacific County serves as our Secretary Treasurer. So you see, we are um, we try and share the wealth and make sure that we're listening to all of the voices across the region. Here are all of the members. This is that territory I was talking about, just over needs to flip the other way, doesn't it? Um, uh, the 7,200 square miles, right? That's a lot of territory. Um, and it is, uh, we cover that territory, um, I think fairly well because we've got good partnerships. We're leveraging and we're working closely with all of our partners. So here's some contact information. Um, I am always willing to talk with commissioners um, I know that uh, we are working on a project now. Um, Commissioner Trask um, is being briefed on the possibility of a grant that we're going for having to do with um, work release and those folks that are coming out of county jails and are we going, could we go after a grant that allows us resources to be able to provide work readiness, employment, training, dollars, for those individuals that are coming out of um, out of county jails and are still in perhaps but need to get ready. That said, we would need to work closely with the elected officials, with all of you, and certainly with jail command. And so we're starting those conversations now. But we would love to be able to have a region-wide um, commitment for that. We do those provide those services already in Thurston County and in Lewis County and would look forward to any opportunity to work with, um, with Mason County on that kind of a uh, set of services. That's considered one of our high priority populations. We know folks with any kind of um, uh, justice involvement struggle. 
Um, it's hard for them often to find jobs. It's hard for them to break that cycle. Um, and so we're trying to help get them over that, over that hump. So we'll be doing more of that conversation in the next um, couple of days, Commissioner. I did get your note about that and we we'll look forward to that conversation. So I'm just gonna stop now. That was quick and hard um, and uh, wanna leave time for any questions or uh, to yield the rest of my time to anything else that you all uh, would like to talk about. Mr. Shudi, I see you unmuted yourself. Are you ready? Yeah, just a, a quick question. I, I appreciate the uh, the updates here. This is a lot of really good information. Um, I see you have uh, a seat for ESD 113 on on the board. Do you um, do you work with ESD 114 as well? Uh, I know Mason County is bisected by both of the both 113 and 114. It's just wondering what the what the collaboration was like with 114 for the north yeah. part of the county. A great question. Um, ESD 113 covers the vast majority of Pack Mountain area, but we, we have, in addition to 114, we have 112 out on the peninsula area. And the, the seat is really about subject matter expertise and not about uh, just representing their area. So um, Superintendent Dana, uh, Anderson sits on the seat as a, our K-12 representative. Not, he is from ESD 113, but he is, the information that he affords is really about K-12 and how the K-12 system is, gotcha. is operating. We've done um, partnerships with both 112 and 114, and we try and include them um, when, we, when we're moving out to speak about youth. Gotcha, I, I appreciate that, thank you. Yeah. Cheryl, in uh, representing the area is very important. Uh, others that knew that you were going to be speaking today had some questions they wanted me to ask of you, and I'm going to simplify them out. Uh, uh, the North Mason area has one third of our population in this county. Specifically, what uh, what is it they what services are you providing up there in the North End? Uh, do you have anybody housed handling things in the North End, which is 30 minutes? away from here and what businesses are you servicing in the North Mason area? Good question. Um, we would need, I would need to get to our business services team. We have um, our, the business services team is a group of folks who provide services to individual businesses. So what I'd like to do is to be able to get that specific report out, Commissioner, and then to send that out to you. But our business services team members um, provide services within the entire Pack Mountain WDA. So that's all of those, those boundaries. Um, the, the service areas, now that we're virtual, a lot of those services are being provided virtually. Um, you know that we're located physically at that, at that Northwest area there, um, at that intersection there and um, with our work source. But you can get any of our services um, virtually and um, we're happy to have those people go out to talk with any individual businesses. Uh, and I, I appreciate that you're happy to do that, but are you doing it? This is yes. the question that yes, I- Yes, so, yes, we are I'm doing that. Me. And I, I, I'll get you the report on how many businesses are being served. Um, and we, we have had, Good conversation, I believe, with the chamber executive um, in in that uh, Belfair area. But I'll, I'll track down that information for you. Thank you, yeah. Commissioner Trass. Did you have something? No, uh, not really. I just want to tell Cheryl that I think she's doing a great job. Um, the staff is amazing. So I know that you guys are you guys you guys have a heart of gold, and you're definitely reaching out and and trying to get those that really need help. So I truly appreciate that. Thank you. Well, we're really looking forward to, I think Mason County is really hopping and popping. And we, we um, uh, are working, I think, to be the best partner that we can with um, Jennifer and her crew, with your, the new operations going in at the YMCA. Um, we're going to have um, uh, 
some AmeriCorps and TANF staff there located in the building. Um, and that just is another way that we see being able to get uh, message into the community about the, the kind of services that we can offer people. Any more questions for Cheryl? No. Thank you. Very, thank you very much for coming in today and, and speaking with us. We appreciate Good. you coming in. I will follow up with um, these materials and then you can broadcast them out. I will also get you, um, Commissioner Netherin, the um, information about the North Mason. <coughs> yeah, I would appreciate that. And anybody they're working with, how they're working with them, if we yes. have anything housed, those are all things that I have to answer to, to some other people. Understand. Well, I appreciate it. I, I didn't have the answers to give them. All okay. right. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, commissioners, do you need a break? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe just a, a real quick one. I don't know what everybody's time is like, but just maybe can we a, come back at uh, 1055, please? Great. Okay. We're on break till 1055. Thank you. All right. Next up, um, community services with Dave Windham. Hey, good morning, commissioners. How are we doing? Good, Dave. Doing awesome. doing? Um, good. Hey, it's Monday, right? Okay. So I'm going to start off with, um, we have in front of you, um, this is Amendment 19 to our CONCON -Con amendments, or to our CONCON. -Con. Uh, so we're coming a little later than we had anticipated. But here now, um, most of what you see represented in the, this amendment is an extension of timelines to the end of uh, June. We probably won't see anything past the end of June in the next, this amendment or the next amendment um, because of the legislature. So that'll all be tied to the next biennial budget, uh, which of course starts uh, July 1st. Uh, most of these things, like I said, are extensions or their additions in the uh, COVID response. So uh, they've added some flexible funding in here, which will allow us to kind of maybe move things some things around a little bit. Um, based on what the governor has put out so far um, and the legislature during this legislative session. It's, uh, like I said, these things do come periodically. Uh, we expect this the first year, especially for the foundational public health services money. Uh, typically that rolls out um, January 1st and here we are near the end of February and uh, here it is. So uh, a little late, but it's here. Uh, just a, a quick question, uh, Any, if you don't mind. Um, this is uh, Dave. You might be able to answer this, or, or even Commissioner Trask through uh, Wasac. But I think I saw last week that um, the governor signed a 2.2 billion dollar um, funding package for COVID relief. Um, do you anticipate any of the any of the COVID um, public health money to come down to the to the county level, or is that Staying with DOH to do DOH stuff, or what? Uh, what are you kind of envisioning happening as a result of uh, that legislation? Well, it looks like most of that money is going to go for vaccines, or a lot of it. If the public health portion will go for vaccines, um, so we might be able to get some to to cover some of those costs, but a lot of the money will go to commerce, and they'll distribute it out to to businesses and places like that. Okay. Great. Thank you. A good percentage of the money that's in the con or in this amendment is wrapped around the uh, box in the virus uh, campaign. So there's uh, money set in there for uh, contact tracing and um, case investigation, which was due to run out. So it, it just refurbishes that account to allow us to keep continuing to do that work. For for all kind of practical purposes, Dave, what what does contact tracing? look like i know you know there are periods of time where state and nationwide frankly that there were you know capacity issues with contact tracing and and that kind of thing i mean what does what does that look like um you know in the next three maybe six months i mean how, how different does that maybe look now than it did before so as we we start to drop down in our numbers that's great because it makes it easier to do some of these things we were at, at one point if we keep up with the case investigations, we're doing good. Uh, this will allow us to do some of that contact tracing in, in more depth. We've been doing it all along, but it's not as thoroughly, I think, as uh, you know, when you have several hundred cases a day a couple times in the last couple months. Um, I see this 
as our the R naught number comes down, so the replication rate starts to drop and it gets below one and our rates come down below 75 per 100,000, we're going to be needing uh, to spend less time in case and contact investigation. In fact, our staff has really been transitioned. We have the three people we put on, they were temporary hires. They're doing the, the majority of that work while the, our regular staff is working uh, very strongly in uh, vaccine clinic preparation and keeping on top of that piece of it. So um, those people we, we hired on a temporary basis will stay doing that work through the next six months and then staff will concentrate on vaccines. Great, thank you. Mr. Trask, do you have anything? No, got nothing. I'm, I'm, I was really hoping that they would extend the dates and also give a lot more of the money um, to counties like they did before, but it doesn't look like that's gonna happen yet unless, well, I, I know some of the budgets are giving money to, to local governments, but that probably won't, we won't know the outcome of that until June. Yeah. Are you uh, comfortable with moving the Amendment 19 to the uh, action agenda? Yes. I am. Okay. Yep. I am also, uh, Dave, you might want to make sure, though, that Jennifer, I don't see her on here, is aware and prepares to have uh, an increase like that uh, in any budget amendment that we may be doing in the near future. That's such a large increase. We need to make sure that's uh, accounted for. Yeah. What do you we'll got? Do. Next? Okay, coming up next, we have Kel and uh, Josh on some contractual stuff. Hi, Kel and Josh. Welcome. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a, um, we are um, bringing back two contracts. We're just renewing two contracts we had from last year uh, for outside services for plans examining and or building inspections. Um, we have a contract with Townsend and Associates and Code Pros, and we'd like to renew both of them. Um, this has been budgeted um, in our budget this year. It helps um, um, with uh, some of our backup um, on doing the plan review. We also have a staff member who's going to be out on maternity leave um, this uh, late spring or summer. So um, in anticipation of that, we uh, are um, going to be needing some backup assistance as well. Now, Kel, is this any different than uh, the contracts? These have already been through a uh, review with uh, Tim. I have not sent them um, uh, to Tim this year. They're the same as last year. So assuming that he saw them last year, although I will route them to him before they get on the action agenda for Tuesday, next Tuesday. Yeah, please do. I, I think they're the same, but just in case, let's just get a buy-in. Uh, yep. Commissioner, are you okay with moving forward with uh, that provision? I am yep. just a, a quick question on how this has been used in the past. Um, I'm assuming that the $50,000 cap, is that $50,000 for both building inspection and plan examining? So, uh, or yeah. is it for each? For both. We, we do have 50,000 budgeted in the 2021 budget for outside services. Okay. And then uh, do you know last year how, how close we got to hitting that 50,000 cap? I believe we hit it. I would have to confirm with Kathy Chausse, but I believe we did um, we did utilize all of it. Okay. I think we asked that question, uh, didn't we, Commissioner? And they did say they used it, I believe. In the budget process? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I believe we did. Um, do you know in order to keep things moving or to get things moving quicker would more be needed or should we well at that? another briefing um that probably that our next briefing i'd like to bring up the discussion of hiring an actual a full-time plans examiner slash building inspector and you'll take that through hr and everything before you bring it to us though right correct but I, I've discussed it with, um, with Kathy and we believe our budget um, and the increase in building permits um, warrants an additional staff member. Okay. 
So we'll bring that uh, back after it goes through the whole pro the proper process first, though. Uh, on this one, does anybody have any issue with moving forward? I don't. Nope. I'm good. Okay. We'll put that on it. Uh, next. Okay, next, excuse me, is uh, vacancies on the Mason County Board of Health. So this is a, essentially just a public announcement. We'll get it on the action agenda. Uh, we have, as of recently, we've added an MD or uh, practicing physician uh, piece into our Board of Health. And then I'd also like to just put out again, the two positions that have been open for uh, one for the Squaxin uh, Island Tribe and one for the Skokomish. So, hmm. and I, I already know the answer to this, but you reach out to them regularly and they're just not in. We have reached out. It's, it's, it's time to reach out again. Okay. And, and Dave, that for the two tribal positions, that can be um, uh, staff versus a, a council member, or how, how do we have that? Is it, is it broad right. or is it, it, it it's narrow? It's, no, it's, it's pretty broad. It can be a tribal designee. Okay. So they could perhaps have a clinical manager uh, uh, attend the Board of Health. It yeah. wouldn't necessarily need to be an elder or somebody in tribal government. Yeah. Well, especially with everything going on right now, you would think that they would get somebody on this uh, with the COVID so that we can have those discussions. So yeah, please reach out again. Uh, commissioners, do either of you have a direct connection with anybody you want to contact? Um, I'm more than happy to make a, make a contact with both of the tribes um, and, and work that. If we want to divide and conquer, that's fine too. Open to whatever. Well, if you're willing to take it on, I, I'm good with that. Okay. Come on. Okay. Tag, you're it, Commissioner. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, 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 Hold on, Dave. Uh, Commissioner Trask, okay. you were saying something? Yeah, yeah, Dave. When you reach out for the the medical profession or professional, how far out will you reach? Will you reach out to the hospitals? I'm just curious as to how you're going to get that word out. Well, we, we're going to do this public announcement. That's going to be the first stage, and then people who are interested can go to the county website and fill out uh, the board application form. So um, we'll put that word out. I'll, I'll talk to the. the uh, CEO at the hospital, and then uh, this will go out community-wide. I would also it maybe- doesn't necessarily have to be South County, North County. Yeah, I would, I would say maybe talk to the uh, Public Hospital District 2 board as well uh, to, to pass on through um, CHI. Uh, Peninsula might have a, a provider that, that would make sense and want to be involved in this. So I touch all those bases, I, I would imagine. Okay. That'll work. What you okay. got there, Dave? All right, I got it shuffled a little bit here, so I'm going to back up, back to Kel. She is still on here. I do not see her. And she, okay, so this is a um, approval to appoint Randy Neff to the Planning Advisory Commission for a term ending January 31, 2022. Commissioner uh, Shudi, that's your your district out there. This person, uh, are, you, are you familiar with him? Uh, just very brief interactions with him in the past. Um, he's a former uh, county employee. Um, I think it might be helpful to interview um, and solicit, um, uh, maybe solicit some additional, uh, I don't know how many applicants, is this the only applicant we, we got? How long were we out? Do you know, Dave? I, I don't know how long we're out. I do have the application in my hand. Um, and I mean, it would not hurt to do a, an interview. Yeah. So we can so, set that up. So Diane, if you don't mind, could you set up an interview for us, please? Uh, and also make sure that we go out uh, with another release, letting people know that we have vacancies. Okay. Okay. And then um, that's good. My next item is with Alex. Yes. Good morning, commissioners. Hey, Alex. Hi. We're bringing our water quality program updates back to you today. Uh, we're finding a few details in our proposal that we've been working on. So 
In our last briefing, we had some questions on including sewer parcels within the SPD and um, proposed fee structure, if we go that route. We have looked at this and it appears the intent and the purpose of the SPDs are really to address non-point pollution sources. Um, and wastewater treatment plants are excluded from a non-point pollution source. Um, those are considered point source um, pollution. So um, there are also quite a few places in the RCWs that prohibit us from charging a fee um, to those that uh, are within the district and already pay some type of wastewater fee. Um, we included those sections for you to review. I also spoke with um, a counterpart in Jefferson County to see what they had done over this. And um, they originally included sewer parcels in their program fees. And then they were later questioned on this. And so they removed the parcels um, due to the language within it. Um, we also spoke with Tim Whitehead on this and he agreed with the intent of the RCWs to address non-point pollution sources and the fact that wastewater treatment parcels are, are not considered you know, non-point sources of pollution. Um, so we're looking for your thoughts and decision on this. Um, our recommendation is to exclude the sewer parcels um, for now, just based on the information that we've dug up. Um, and in case you're curious, this accounts to about 5,000 parcels that I can find um, with the big portion of that being within the city of Shelton. So just looking for some information and, and your thoughts on this. Yeah, Alex, just a, a question on that. Um, I think, you know, the law, the law says what the law says, and, and I think we have to be, you know, compliant with that part of it. Um, that said, you know, it, it had always at least been anecdotal about, you know, su um, you know, the wastewater facility in Shelton and what that may or may not contribute to um, closures uh, through Hammersley and downgrades and that kind of thing. How are they, how, how do they address that then? Um, and how do you work with, with folks at the city to make sure that if it is contributing to it, they're addressing it or to rule them out, I guess, essentially as, as a culprit? Well, yeah, and really the, the intent behind the RCWs that, that we can find is that, I mean, we're kind of excluded from those issues. Um, when those issues arise, I mean, they definitely are pollution issues that can affect harvest areas. And so DOH definitely, you know, has downgrades and, and things that can come from that. But the county really doesn't have much action to take. Um, you know, these wastewater treatment facilities, they're they're regulated with, you know, EPA and um, State Department of Ecology. So usually when that occurs, um, it's the State Department of Health and Ecology working with the treatment facility on, a, on resolving any type of issues in, in relation to harvest area. And the county just doesn't really get much involved. Um, if there is, you know, a health aspect, we might, you know, do some sort of public, you know, um, news release. But other than that, there's not a lot of action for us typically to take. Um, a good example of that was the stuff that went down a couple years ago in regards to the city of Shelton treatment facility. Um, DOH did change some of their harvest boundaries. And so you could see that as a downgrade, I guess. Um, and there wasn't any action for us to take, you know, I think they had given a notice to the commission, but, um, you know, there wasn't any other, you know, work for us to do. Okay. I think ecology and DNR. Um, took the lead on that, didn't they? Correct. So it's not like we would be potentially doing work within within the you know addressing city issues without being able to collect on that. Yeah, our you know we we do work within these these sewer districts at times, but um, not from a wastewater treatment standpoint um it's it's just not a non-point source that we usually have the authority to to regulate or be involved with gotcha and you know as commissioner shooty said uh i can't disagree that the law is the law is the law when and what you explained uh i i don't see any confusion uh i don't think that we can include those parcels the one thing I do ask is, uh, you know, a rose by another name. Uh, is there a different type of district or entity that we can do? For example, uh, a local improvement district that focuses on that, that covers the county uh, or some other type of entity. 
that we can look at. And you don't have to have the answer today. I, what I guess what I'm doing is just asking you to consider that and look at some of the other options. We get stuck in just one name that may have an effect on what we can and cannot do. If we open up our minds to a different name, it may give us other options and opportunities. Because I do believe there is such a thing as a local improvement district that focuses on water quality and stuff, but we can, we'll, we'll look at the different options and maybe bring that back to us. You know, another another alternative is um, is seeing if uh, you know, you know, if the city would be willing to maybe contribute in some way to the work um, financially to help support it. Um, that might be another alternative that uh, you know might might be worth looking at if we can't, as Commissioner Netherland suggests, come up with another mechanism to do this. Um, so just a thought. Yeah, and I will add, I mean, not to get too opinionated on this, but the, the city of Shelton really, if you look at the, the details and the specifics around it, I mean, there's no shellfish harvest area that adjoins the city of Shelton because of their outfall right there. And then also the activities with the, you know, Sierra Pacific and stuff. And, and I think it's, it's unlikely that we'll see harvest area there um, anytime soon. So, I mean, DOH has that whole area closed. So really in terms of past projects, even with pick work and, and we just don't ever find ourselves along those shorelines um, for, for those reasons. Alex, uh, if you got a pen, uh, 36, nine 36.94.490 and uh that'll also refer you back to uh uh 36.94.020 if you could take a look at those uh and how it shows that there's certain abilities to do some of this stuff i'd appreciate it did you yeah, i'll take a look at that thank you do you need anything else from us on this so far except for a pat on the back and thanking you for moving forward and, and doing a good job on this um, yeah, just uh, in addition, I mean, looking at our program estimated budget, um, I don't know if you want me to go through all that, if you guys have had a chance to review it. I asked Ian Tracy to join us today. Um, he's been helping me out a lot. He's our current only EHS working both our water quality projects, and he's been helping me on these efforts. But um, in short, we're not reinventing any wheels here. Um, our program proposal and these objectives are very similar to other county water quality programs where we're looking for some ambient stream drainage sampling, filling in gaps um, with uh, some of these other tribes and partners in the work that they're doing. Um, by aligning ourselves with the DOH harvest areas, with shoreline monitoring, we can hit more areas more often at less of a cost. Um, and then also increasing our O&M efforts, um, being um, increasing transparency with all this data that we're collecting, putting it into, you know, some GIS mapping and, and, and routine reports. Um, and then lastly is, you know, the pick and the correction effort, we would have, you know, some ability to do that um, if it's, you know, specific parcels, single parcel issues, but um, kind of leaving grants up to that because it, you know, as this water quality issues kind of problems come and go. And so it makes more sense to tackle that from a grant aspect um, than a routine funding. And uh, other than that, we included a breakdown of our estimated budget and the parcel counts. Are there any questions on any of this? I have a couple of comments on it though. Just in my opinion, you know, the one of my reasons for being supportive of this is the PIC projects. I think it's probably one of the most important things that, that we tools we have. I also want to remind you, I think that Commissioner Shudi supported this in the past. I'm not positive, so I correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think we're in support of making sure that whatever we put together is a sunset clause uh, on this. And uh, I already see that we're starting to adjust the fee to, to make up for the uh, how much is needed. It, it's only six cents, I get that, but that's the thing that I worry about the most when we start looking at doing things like this. So we want to find a way to make sure that we keep a cap on what we're doing and that doesn't start to have a, a creep, um, scope creep and cost creep as we start moving forward. Did I catch that right, Commissioner Schutte? Uh, were you supportive of uh, Sunset at one point? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I have no issues with a with with having a sunset and a reauthorization vote um, over a period of time. 
Um, yeah, I would be interested in hearing a little bit of Ian's perspective. Um, you know, I, I, he took the time to join us today. If, if everybody's good with that, I'd like to hear a little bit about how this might impact the work that he does for us and kind of what the boots on the ground perspective would be. Yeah, please, Ian, unmute yourself. Hello, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Um, yeah, I think it's really important if we can get some funding like this. Um, just, you know, I have, I've only been here a year, but uh, what I've seen throughout the history of water quality projects in Mason County is that we have progress on certain problems that then falls off as grant funding ends. And there are issues that never quite get fully addressed or take a lot longer than usual to get addressed. Um, so I think if we do have some capacity within Mason County to keep things going and keep water quality work going and not ending at, at fixed dates, um, I think that'd be really important and really good for the citizens of Mason County. Ian, how much, um, how much interaction do you have with the public um, as you're out doing your work and what are, what are some of their what are some of what's some of the feedback you receive from them as as you maybe engage on on just the pick work and ways to improve and things like that? Um, yeah, I, I interact with the public a lot. That's the primary part of my job is working with the public um, and working with them on water quality issues, surveying properties that are that are waterfront. Um, a lot of people think that we are monitoring everything everywhere. They think that our program is a lot more comprehensive than it actually is and um, they're concerned when they find that we're just doing things on a grant basis they think that we have just an ongoing program making sure everything is safe everywhere um, and then they're <laughs> fairly concerned when they find that we're, our program is not as uh, all-encompassing as they as they perceived it to be but they're they're very supportive of water quality work they're very supportive of keeping the water clean um, I haven't found anyone who is <laughs> really resistant to it. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions on that, commissioners? No, just uh, Alex. What do you kind of envision is is the next uh, next steps here? What are you What are you looking for, or what 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 do you need feedback wise yeah. from us? Yeah. Uh, well. We've ironed out a lot of the details and questions, I think, that our partners and that we have had um, with you all. I appreciate all your time on this past few months. Um, I think we're ready to kind of start drafting ordinance and having you guys review that. Um, so with your approval, that's what I would be working on next. You know, I was supportive of this. Um, I think the first time that you brought it up at one of our Oakland Bay meetings. And so look forward to, to your draft. Same here. Thank you, Alex. Great. Right. Thank you, commissioners. All right, Dave, what do you got next? Okay. Um, coming up. Uh, create. Okay. This is a uh, item that creates an accounting technician position in, in public health to assist with uh, grant accounting and billing. And this is a, a 0.5 FTE position. Uh, the budget impact is 36614 and 16 cents a year. Uh, would require a budget amendment. So uh, working with Casey and with HR on those pieces. Um, the, the thinking behind this, uh, adding, adding a half-time position to assist the finance manager with um, all these new grants that we're, we're getting through. We're putting through a lot of new grant work. And uh, as you know, public health is primarily funded through, through grant work. Uh, this year it's going to be between grants and fee-for-service. That, that is our funding stream. So we're looking to um, expand that capacity and it, it kind of dovetails in, well, it actually does dovetail in very well with the recommendation from the uh, audit committee that says we need to have a backup for that position because at the, at the time we have right now, we, need to, we're, we don't have depth in that particular part of our fiscal uh, office. So um, the auditors committee recommended that we add staffing and then train, cross-train staffing to do some of those things in case we lose somebody for you know, whatever reason, get somebody out for a long time for, for an illness, whatever, we have that piece there. So uh, we do have in these grants enough administrative fees to cover this position. So I'm not worried about the 
financial cost of it, but it will take a budget amendment to allow the, the, the lower right-hand corner spending. And this has uh, gone through uh, HR? Yeah, so we, I talked to Frank about it and HR provided me with, uh, we, we've gone over it kind of rewritten because the, the old position description was, well, it was old. So we've updated that. Uh, it looks good. It's through the um, uh, local bargaining agreement. This will be a Teamsters uh, general services uh, position. And um, I think we're good to go on all those pieces. If, if I may add to that. God um, assist me in cleaning up a lot of Frank, go ahead. Um, as far as the review by HR, so HR is reviewing or had reviewed the request for the position. The statement by the auditor's office was more a comment around the lack of internal controls, as well as the lack of um, covering for the finance manager should the finance manager um, position be vacated. There's nobody backing up that position. This part-time MTE will not solve that part of the auditor's comments. Um, this position will not be able to fill the finance manager or backfill the finance manager should there be a vacancy in that position for whatever reason. So the reasoning for the job is um, a question I have. Um, other than the workload that might be enhanced because of the amount of grants that are being managed. But I believe this is a request for a full-time FTE, a permanent, not a temporary FTE. This would be a permanent half-time FTE as written. So, so the funding that the grants offer to hire this person Will ultimately disappear as when the grants disappear and the um, position will then need to be funded by um, other resources within the health department. So what grants are would, would be used? Are they COVID grants or are they um, other grants that are around every year? So we've got a, a number of grants that are going through. You got the lead grant uh, which added to the workload and, and added revenues as well. We've got uh, a Hep C grant that's two hundred thousand every other year, uh, so basically one hundred and two thousand dollars per year on the Hep C grant uh, with its administrative costs. So there are those other pieces that are um, not just COVID that are coming in that are new. Um, David, are you are you open to the idea of a position like this for a one year, two year term? for the moment to get to start this through right i myself guys just you know i see a need for this position with all the grants that are happening right now it's kind of got to be crazy but i've always been a big supporter of grant writers and and uh the monies that can come with that uh but i also understand you know the worries that if the money isn't there in a couple years uh hate to lay people off rather their position just end if that's how it's going to work so I don't know, what, what do you think, Dave? I, I hate to put you in that position, but uh, that's what I'm thinking in my head. Where are you at on that? Well, you know, public health is always in that position. So uh, whether, it's, whether it's in the housing or whether it's Hep C or uh, any of our grant-driven programs, they're driven as long as there is grant funding associated with them. So, um, you know, there are times when you need to let people go when the grant ends. Um, it's, it, it's not unreasonable to say that we could look at this in a year or two years, though, to see if the volume of grants still justify the position. Uh, and they may, in one or two years, uh, depending on how things go with the legislature, be even uh, more of a requirement to add, you know, go to a full-time person. But, but we could do a year, at, certainly, and see what it looks like and, and come back to this in a year. Does that make you more comfortable, commissioners? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, that would 
certainly make me a little bit more comfortable with it. I'd like to, Dave, I'd like to chat with you a little bit offline um, about this and how it fits in a little bit more globally. I don't know if, if you have another you know, week to, to kind of sit on this and, and have that conversation or what your urgency level is, um, but that would be my preference at the moment. Are you comfortable with that, Dave? Yeah, that's, that's no problem. Yeah, we try to empower each other to have the time when needed, so. Also, just real quick, can yeah, do you- No, I can me? certainly do that. Thank you. You can tell there's a delay. Um, Dave, is there a way that you can get a list of the grants um, that you guys currently have? It's got to be somewhere. I know one thing that, that I would like to, to maybe have the entire county take a look at is everybody um, get on Munis. I know that we have some departments that are not using Munis and that they then they have to transfer things from, let's say, Excel over to Munis, whereas if they were using Munis, everything would be right there and there would be no, um, that might be a, a time saver as well. Um, so think of that also when you're, when you're reviewing this. Um, I know that would take time also to, to um, get everything put into Munis. And Frank, I think that there's also other um, programs that Munis has available that, that would be very, um, cost effective and make it efficient also. So that, that might be just something that to you know, put a bug in your ear, but I think that it would probably be a good thing for the entire county to move over to one system instead of having a variety. If there are, there are. So is, is there a, sorry, go ahead, Dave. I was going to ask, is, is there a module? Because my understanding was there's a module that doesn't support what we're doing right now is our module that would need to be purchased to do that. Yeah, and I think we I think we have that on several layers. We do uh, have grants, we have a grants module, we have a contracts module. So both of those can handle those pieces of the work that currently is being done, let's say manually outside the system, either using access or Excel. It just makes sense to me that everybody be on the same system. Yeah, but the treasurer and other ones, they have not been able to do some of that, correct? We have certain areas that have to have their own. Um, no, we've chosen not to incorporate them yet at this time because of the time and effort involved in moving towards a consolidation. Uh, there again, the first consolidation needs to be a, a rewriting of the cost codes, the accounting codes. That was delayed last year because of COVID. It's expected to be part of this year's uh, goals. Once those are done, then time collection, payroll collection, as it relates to grants, contracts, and even for the sheriff's office, are capable and available to manage independent, separate from the independent systems that we currently have and incorporate them all into MUNIS. Well, to empower Commissioner Trask's uh, uh, idea of moving forward with this, on the 4th of March, we're having an audit committee meeting. Uh, Diane, I don't see her on here. Could you make sure, Frank, that that becomes part of the discussion? that we look at those yeah. options and look at, I don't want to say the word forcing, look at, I don't have another word, but, but uh, getting everybody on the, on the same page um, uh, as a requirement through the county. I will do that. So Commissioner Trask, on, uh, during that audit committee, we'll have a lot of them together. Let's bring, you know, I'll make sure that, that comes up and we'll see what it looks like to, to move that forward. If, if it is a chosen wall that we've been, suffering then maybe we need to overcome that uh that that issue and choose differently right and i'm just wondering because i know that there are some uh, a, a program that that's being used by by dcv that i'm wondering if instead of double duty um if that would save time and make it easier for um dave's accounting crew to manage so just a thought 
Thank you. Dave, did you have more on uh, on this? So you're comfortable you'll meet with uh, Commissioner Schutte over this next week and we'll table this and bring it back? Absolutely. I'll, I'll give it to Commissioner Schutte and we'll, we'll uh, chat about this one and, and uh, kind of map something out. And then uh, Casey's on vacation this week, Commissioner Trask. So when he comes back next week, I'll have a list for you. I think it's like 32 different contracts right now that we're, we're currently uh, monitoring. So we'll get you that official number. And, and the and the values attached to it. Perfect, thank you. All right, Dave, what do you got okay. next? Okay. All right, next, moving right along and, and <laughs> asking for another body. So uh, this is a temporary position in environmental health to assist with meeting objectives uh, 5.2.1.2 uh, through 5.2.1.4 of the Mason Squaxin Tribe MOU. So as you know, we signed that a couple of years ago and COVID has put us you know, quite a ways behind. One of the pieces of this is to look at our wells and to, and to sift out of our group B wells, which ones are two um, uh, connection wells, which ones are multi-connection wells, because we really haven't got that into a database of any kind. It's just all in paper. And uh, it was one of our agreements was to, to sift that out so um, what I'm asking for is to bring up somebody in from Dawn's strategic um, reserve of folks that, that she kind of has over there for clerical and bring them in, pull those um, uh, records out, find those wells, determine what's a two-party well, what's a multi-party well, and then get that scanned into SmartGov so we don't have to go through this process again. And uh, as Alex was talking, I was going back through our contracts, kind of looking through the the finer details. I was going to ask for six thousand dollars, but I found where I can tag this into current um, uh, grant funding, and uh, I, there should be no impact to the budget other than we're going to spend six thousand dollars from where I'm looking to put it at, through is the Foundation of Public Health Services environmental health piece. There's an environmental health piece and an assessment piece. I think this would dovetail into both of those, and we would be able to justify the expense there. And you can't do it under extra help. Yes, we could do under extra help. I guess oh, yeah. I didn't use the proper term there. Yeah, I, I think that makes more sense than creating a position through the budget. Yes, it'd be an, it would be it would be extra help clerical position is what I'm asking for. We usually have a line item for that too, though, somewhere in your budget. Commissioners, where are you at on this? Yeah, I, you know, I'm supportive. I think uh, terminology aside, I mean, it, we have an agreement and we need to, we need to meet the objectives of the agreement. Um, if we don't, that might cost more than $6,000 in the long run. Yeah, agreed. And I think it's only for two months um, or shorter if the, the, um, if, if the information is gathered, correct? Correct. Yeah, so what I can do is I can go ahead and clean up the terminology on this and then bring it back to the action agenda. Okay, uh, Frank, uh, is there any way that he could just incorporate it into what he already has instead of having to go through all that? Uh, underneath his extra helpline? I, I was just looking his extra helpline up, didn't get to it, but yes, absolutely. If he has an extra helpline, he can okay. slide it in under that without having to go back through the board again. That'd be my recommendation, Dave, if, if possible. If not, then we'll right. go. Through that would work for me. Process. Yeah, if not, we'll go through whatever process is necessary, bring it back to the action agenda. But if if we can, let's go through what, what we already have this way we won't have the budget amendments, and everything else comes with it. All right, what, what else do you have for us? Okay, let's see. Um, oh, the fun stuff. Raya 14 and Raya 15. I'm sure everyone read the entire document package. It's 600 and some pages. Um, uh, the, the package uh, is online. So for the community that would like to, to read it in the briefing notes, it does say that the, uh, the document is online and it's on the, the ecology website. So where we're at on this is we are at the final draft uh, and the document is out for local review. So this is a part of that local review process uh, as we go through that. In April, April 15th, we'll be having a, 
uh, meeting for RIA 15 to give the, the committee's final up or down on the RIA 15 uh, draft proposal. If it uh, survives that, then it goes to ecology for uh, rulemaking and then would come back to us uh, in June. The next week, and that would be uh, April 22nd, it would be the same thing for RIA 14. So RIA 14 would uh, either move forward or not at that committee meeting, go to ecology and then come back to us for adoption by resolution or by ordinance. I was hoping and Mr. Shooty got to go first. Those nuts? <laughs> no, unfortunately, no, that's the way they, they've set it up is right 15 is going first. Um, and then should those not survive the uh, committee thumbs up or thumbs down, then the draft plan as written is submitted to ecology. Ecology will uh, make their changes to the draft plans submit them to the Salmon Recovery Board for their opinion. It will come back to Ecology for final rulemaking, and that may take as long as another year or more. So there's no actual timeline on when Ecology has to have the rulemaking done if these are not approved at the committee level. Do you know how we're going to do this? Is it going to be a straight, uh, we agree to move forward or we don't? Yes. And the odds of it moving forward are? All of that, I can't speak to Commissioner. There's, there's some uh, things out there that I, especially in Riot 15, um, with the northern end of folks, that uh, it'd be very difficult for me to speculate on. Okay. Commissioners, where are you at? What do you think? Uh, I mean, we got to do it. No way around it. And I don't know much about this. this. This is definitely in your areas. And so I would I would trust uh, the direction that you guys would suggest. I've been in the middle of this battle for quite a I, while. But when the push comes to shove in the end, I would hope we would uh, support our director who has been through this battle from beginning to end and give that person the authority to make the the vote on our, our behalf on that one because uh, it's from that it still comes to us for our hearings but i does our director want that <laughs> <laughs> our director is a little not comfortable with that i mean we, um, we don't want to we, 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 we don't want to create a fourth commissioner here would we i mean <laughs> no but at the same time it's just in that committee yeah. As our as our yes our expert because I'm not comfortable. Yeah, with I was it. I was pretty comfortable. With it. Twenty two and twenty three was kind of a different thing in that there were no policies attached with the twenty two twenty three RIA work. It was strictly technical work of how much water is being used and how many projects do we have to offset the water, and we were we were offsetting five to one what the need was so that one was a pretty easy one to put forward this is a little more um difficult on my personal belief I'm, i don't believe that i'm in a position where i am in support of accepting the plan as it is you guys have each read it as well uh do you see where we even have the ability to be able to accept it with the provisions that are in some of this Uh, I'll say this, I think 14 is a little bit better than 15. So if we're looking at it in relative terms, I mean, I, I, I probably would, you know, probably could handle 14 more than 15. So, but take, uh, take that with, with a grain of salt, I guess. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm truly anxious or interested in hearing public, public feedback on this and uh, hearing, hearing what our constituents have to say. So Dave, what do you think? How do you think we should be handling this? What's your recommendation? Well, um, you know, one thing we could do is I could do maybe a town hall with this uh, in order to, to uh, garner some feedback. Would that be of interest to the commission? 
here's a here's an alternative maybe to consider dave uh so i know the city is going to have some kind of a public uh process on to receive feedback they're only in 15 i believe they're not or 14 rather they're not they're not doing a 15 project but maybe there's a way to um partner with them on 14 um to handle you know some of the sort of logistical issues there and, and and that kind of thing so it might be worth a maybe a phone call to to their city manager to talk about that um how, how you want to handle 15 maybe is a little bit different but just a just a thought on how we might want to approach getting getting some feedback and and not add too much to your plate given all the other things that are going on yeah i should do that You know, if it's going to be killed, I, I think we're always in a better position to allow them, the others, to to not pass it. And then, you know, for us to have full out public hearings on something that is not going to pass doesn't even make sense to me. But to do it the way it was just recommended, just sitting in and being a part of it to take uh, input makes sense. Did that make any sense? <laughs> I'm always okay. getting public input. It didn't not make sense. Right. <laughs> Great. I didn't understand that one either. So. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll reach out to Jeff, and uh, you know, in the north end, it's a different deal though because we really aren't the the nexus of what's being talked about in the north end. Really, you know, Kitsap and and uh, uh, Kitsap PUD really tend to be the focus up there. Well, and then Pierce County as well. So, I mean, that is just, a, it's the dynamic is much different in Raya 15 than it is in 14. Could you check with them to see if they're doing any um, town halls or, or asking for public input? I can do that. And, you know, Angela has offered some, um, Public outreach materials. I'll go see if she's got those up on. Uh, well, it's not base camp. It's uh, box. So I'll I'll check the account on box and see what's out there for uh, uh, materials, and maybe we can put those out as well. So are you in a position now where you think we should consider some of the policy implementations they're they're putting forward? Well, some of the I think the worst of the policy things were removed. Okay. Um, there are some policy things in there that. <laughs> but once we open the door for. There the are still some things in there, I think, that I'm not. Once we open the door for policy, do we not open the door for policy? Because this thing will be challenged later on, and it'll be challenged on intent with all that verbiage that's been added in after the fact. Once policy is allowed, yeah. doesn't that open us up for a lot of danger in the future? And, you know, that's been part of the conversation that's come out of Kitsap as well. There's some, some real concern that, that the policies that are in the 15 plan um, will almost encourage litigation down the road. It will. I agree with them. But that's how this whole thing has been set up from the beginning, but especially the last three quarters of it has been dedicated to doing it and putting it in a position for litigation. And because of that, I think we're in a stronger position and, and a smarter position to let others just say no and let it go to the side and, and let ecology do their work. Hopefully with input from all of us. What are you hoping you're gonna well, get? From today? The dangers of, well, today, today is just a discussion of kind of where we want to go with this. Is there more outreach we need to do? We have time between now and April 15th. Um, so uh, we have that window available. So I'm just kind of looking at, you know, we have the documents. How do we want to go about talking to the public about them, getting any feedback from the public before we go into a hearing process? Once we get the thing back from ecology, then we go through our hearing and, and adoption of, uh, through uh, ordinance. But um, I, I so, think the feedback we should probably be garnering. 
So maybe, you know, maybe one of the things that we could do here in, in the interim is um, maybe just do a, a press release saying that these are, um, you know, whatever the final draft form, they're available on our website and, and let the public know that they can go there and review them. And if they have questions or concerns, um, you know, they could either they could either send them directly to the commission or to you or some other some other you know avenue to kind of collect that information. But um, you know that might be the best way to get it kind of kicked off uh, and and just start the process that way. And that way, at least we're we're engaging a little bit on it and get some feedback um, before we have to go back to committee and, and make recommendations. And I would prefer that you send it through, yeah. you send the response, have it go through you first and then send it back out to us. I would hate for us to get responses and not make it to you uh, accidentally. It makes more sense if it comes the other way. Put a web, you know, put a email address or something so they can comment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We could do, do like a dedicated email address just for the, the feedback on that. All right, everybody comfortable with that? Okay, well, that gives me direction. Okay, what else you got, Dave? I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions for Dave? I do not. All right. Thank you, Dave. Commissioners, do you mind if we jump out of order and uh, let uh, our guest speak before our staff? Uh, Jennifer is still here online and she's uh, her time is, is passed. Do we mind if we put her ahead of uh, the public works? No. I have no problem with that. No. Okay. Jennifer, do you mind uh, if we move you up and let you get off of here? No, <laughs> I'll send a thank you letter to Loretta. <laughs> Sorry, Loretta. <laughs> Um, so just kind of wanted to get back on your schedule. So this is more of a, of a overview of what it is that we've been working on, getting back in the habit of our monthly briefing. So I'll be back on like clockwork. You guys are going to get tired of seeing my face. So um, just kind of wanted to give you a few quick updates and feel free to jump in with any questions. I'm happy to answer um, the next rounds of grant funding are still being considered at how to do um, them at the Department of Commerce. It's looking like they're going to do like they did with Working Washington 3 and do the online process. Um, they are going to pull in the ADOs to help vet those businesses. They skip that step in, in the Working Washington 3 and they're noticing quite a few irregularities that are happening with the businesses that they've chosen. So we're, we're kind of doing a hybrid model, I guess. We're not doing the same way the first, we're not doing the same way the third, we're kind of splitting the difference and hopefully that'll be the best. They are dividing it into two different programs. One of them is gonna be 150 million to help businesses maintain their operations. So if restaurants as they start ramping forward need help with their supplies or um, COVID um, extra dividers, things like that, that's maintaining your business moving forward. The other 900 or $90 million, $900 million, that would be nice. <laughs> the other $90 million, um, they are trying to focus in on businesses that were temporarily closed or like completely and totally closed. They are also going about um, making sure that either they're newer businesses that haven't had previous grant funding or taking into consideration grant funding that they've already had. So they've added a, a separate layer of complex um, math working in there so you can get up to, in the wording, you can get up to 75,000. That minuses out what you've already gotten from your Working Washington grant. So depending on whether or not you were awarded in any of the three rounds of Working Washington, that funding can come out. Commerce, it looks like right now as it stands, they're putting a cap at 25,000 for business. So I'll keep you updated as that moves forward. Are you there saying are some, 25 per business with uh, counting what they had already received or just 25 so per business? These are, these are good questions, Randy, that they haven't really worked out those specifics. So 
the way I understood it at our last meeting, 75,000 is the cap. Um, they're gonna minus out what you've already received. And if you are around that 25,000, you could potentially get that 25,000. The other way that they might vote is 25,000 is the cap. And if you got 10,000, then you would only be eligible for 15. So I think the goal is to really look at how many businesses they're going to be able to help, which makes me feel like they're probably gonna set that cap, not at the wording that the bill um, that Inslee signed went into, but at that 25,000. Uh, on the maintenance uh, or maintaining of their business, if you get an opportunity, ask them if they're going to allow for uh, capital improvements, for example, windows and, and okay. access for air, because there are some of these businesses that we're not able to open that may take them, that as an opportunity to make some structural changes in case this comes back on them again. Okay, that's a good note. I'll make sure we get an answer for you. Um, they do also, um, just to give you kind of an idea of ineligible businesses, nonprofits, businesses without a physical location in Washington, religious institutions, government entities, businesses primarily engaged in political or lobbying efforts, they've removed um, marijuana, because these are federal dollars that can't be covered. Um, and any businesses that have had regulatory or compliance issues in 20, uh, from March, 2020. They didn't have any wording for that in the last one. So that was some of the discussion that came out of that Working Washington 3, 3 program that they used as well. So I'll keep you updated. They're looking to launch this at the latest by the end of March. Um, and it will be an online program they are Having the EDCs verify businesses, that was one of the issues that they ran into was a business could put whichever county they wanted to, and it was pulled from that county. So um, in our list of businesses, we had five businesses that weren't Mason County residents, but they put Mason County, either they had a mailing address, but their physical location wasn't in Mason County. So they're working to kind of resolve those issues with the next moving forward. Um, the other thing that I wanted to give you guys, at, at least on the positive side of it, we've got quite a few development projects that we're working on and it's, um, so let's see, on the list, there's about eight and half of those are in the North and half of those are in, in the Shelton UGA area. So we're looking at a pretty good division, a lot of, the um, two of them we aren't going to be able to respond to because they require buildings, but it gives us good data to be able to work with our partners on moving those buildings being being engaged and <laughs> built much faster, like the Port of Shelton has approved building a building, but they've um, been waiting to see you know, if a current tenant is going to move into it or if they wanted to build a building um, without a dedicated tenant. So this helps them make those decisions a little bit more informed that they're looking at one of them, it's, it's practically written for them. It is a business that needs 30,000 square feet located next to um, an airport and it needs to be a flat buildable lot. It's, um, I'm pulling it up right now, sorry. Um, so it's a manufacturing job that's going to bring potentially 50 to 75 jobs into the area. We're still going to um, put in an application for it, but when it has existing building preferred, we get bumped even further down that list, that, that prioritized list that they have. So um, it's helpful in helping us know what it is that we don't have, what infrastructure we need to make sure is in place in those areas that are seeing or um, potentially experiencing developers looking at them. We have had um, a few reach out to us because of the, the publicity that the city is getting on their workforce development project. So it's, it's had a a side benefit in that there's been enough 
discussion that's happening, either pro or con, um, wherever you sit on that, that um, the city is being seen as being very pro-business. So we have quite a few developers that are looking at um, acreage within the city of Shelton um, to kind of capitalize on what they see as a positive idea for, for growth. Um, we've got two projects that um, are that we're going to be partnering with on some USDA funding for development in our area. They have a public aspect to it, so it makes for a great partnership. So we'll keep you updated as those move forward. Um, we've got some movement on the hotel project. COVID has really just kind of slammed back developers and it feels like they're reaching that kind of over the edge um, looking at the future. We've been through it now. Um, Dave Windham's has said at our county meetings that he's buying cakes because we're at our year anniversary. So it's been a year that we've been handling COVID. And I think those developers are, are like our businesses. They're reaching an equilibrium on where we are and being able to be a little bit more flexible and they're moving. So they're looking at different projects. They're looking at different areas that they wouldn't normally look at. And that's where we're getting a lot of, of interest in. So just kind of a brief overview. I did, um, if you guys are open to it, I did talk with each of you about the, the county's 10 acre parcel that sits behind of potential development by O'Reilly's. I just kind of wanted to get a measure as to whether or not, um, or where you guys are on different easement language. I know I talked with Lisa Frazier at the treasurer's office about the timeline. And um, once you send in the order to sell, nothing can be changed on that property. That needs to be about six weeks before the auction. Um, so there is a little bit of room if you guys were willing to talk easement language, um, if that's something that you're interested in, or if it's simply that you want to sell it and that's the discussion that I need to have with the developer. So I wanted all three of you guys to be together to kind of work through this. And um, I know that, that you had conversations that, I mean, even predate when we were brought in. So um, I'd love to get some feedback on that project so that I can talk with the developer and we can either get that moving forward or um, get them signed up to be at the auction at least. <laughs> Oh. Yes, sure. I had, um, I think Frank and Kel were going to get together to see if there were some other options as well. Okay. So, um, Frank, were you able to get together with, with Kel? I have not yet. So, uh, but I will. Great. Thank you. Okay. I can follow up with Frank as well. That works. All right. Well then, just it was just really more to get back in front of your face. Um, Cheryl did definitely talk about our unemployment, so I can talk with you a little bit about what that looks like. Um, we are seeing a decline. We are sitting at about 8.7 right now, which is still high for us. We're not back to pre-COVID times, but we are each month trending, each week trending down. There are what we're seeing right now a little bit and where we're holding is that people with the new phase shift are waiting to see if the business that they've been waiting for is going to come back online so that they can just go back to the job that they either have or kind of in hold or were furloughed from. Um, there are jobs that are available. There are worker retraining dollars that are available as well. So. Um, we haven't seen quite as much of a hit lately because people are, are transitioning to different uh, employment opportunities. But I think with this next phase two, we'll start to see a bigger drop um, as things can be open more. We saw that bigger drop in King, Snohomish and Thurston when they were opened and they were opened about a month before kind of the rest of us. So we'll start to see that trend move down for us as well. Um, and then it's gonna become a focus in getting people who aren't going to be able to go back to their job into a different position. 
Commissioners, do you have any questions for Jennifer? Yeah, I, I do. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, so Jennifer, when a little bit ago, you referred to the um, the perception that, that the city of Shelton is very pro-business. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about that in terms of what the city is doing that makes it, um, I'm going to say it makes it appear that they're pro-business. I'm not saying that they aren't pro-business, but what what is driving that sort of thought out out in the development community that, that Shelton is, is pro-business? I think it mostly is coming from um, their openness to discuss a project of the size of the workforce housing. Um, they haven't done anything overtly. They haven't gone out and marketed it. They've just had the public meetings that have been um, pretty pretty brutal on both sides because you have some some big opposition against it. It's mostly just the developers that have looked at different projects in the area have that, that Google watch on us. <laughs> so they're watching us before even reaching out. So I don't think it's anything that the city has done, but um, I'm happy to ask that question to the developers that we're, that we're working with. Yeah, you know, because I, I didn't know if it was sort of, you know, an attitude, um, and I mean that in a positive way, an attitude that um, the city council and staff were, pro you know, projecting into the community if it was, you know, investments or access to infrastructure or just kind of what, you know, what's precipitating that, um, that perception out there and be interested to just get, get a little bit more, you know, information or a sense for that. Okay. I'll drill down on that and I'll get you some, some concrete answers from them. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, well, thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate you coming and speaking with us. Glad we were able to move you forward a little bit. <laughs> yeah, thanks for letting me jump the line. I appreciate it. <laughs> have, a great, have a great day. Thanks, you guys Take too. Care. Take care. Next up uh, uh, is uh, our public works and I'll start with an apology uh, for for doing that to you. And I'm going to ask if you can do things, if at all possible, in the short form. So we can get through <laughs> Absolutely. And We're still through. awake. <laughs> Happy noon, commissioners. OK, first up, private line occupancy permit. <clears throat> Yay or nay? How's that for uh, form? I, I'm supportive. It, it's, it's usual business. Usual business. I'm good. Same. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Next item, we have um, a request to go forth and do um, some cruising and follow up with either a thin or a harvest um, after declaring surplus timber. And you have a list of properties that Public Works and our utilities um, funds own. And those are the properties that we're looking to um, have someone evaluate our timber stands and manage them appropriately. What is the cost that you're looking at for this? Gosh, I wanna say last time we did it, it was, I wanna say around $6,000 mm -hmm. commissioner. That's not much. I in the past they wanted a lot more than that to do some of this, so I'm yeah. I mean, sort of at six thousand dollars. Yeah, I can get you enough if that's if, if that is a, a big issue. I can certainly follow up next week with what the the dollar. Well, we'll we'll have it in the the action agenda. What the ballpark he is. Okay, because the the other option was to allow some of these entities to come on and do their own uh, bidding for it, basically non-binding bids that uh, tell us what they're going to take off and how they would do it. And uh, right. that's benefited us greatly in the past. Yeah. Uh, the difference between, I think the low was 285,000 and the high was 1.28 million. Hmm. So, okay, next. All right, next up is a purchase of an equipment trailer off of the state contract. Um, we were looking to purchase another uh, uh, three axle tilt trailer uh, for transporting equipment around. Um, this is on state bid and it is a 2021 budget item. Any issues, commissioners? Not for me. Oh. Me either. We'll move forward. Thank you. 
All right, next up is Richard on board. Maybe? <laughs> he's on board, he's unmuted, but I'm not hearing from him. Richard? <laughs> I don't know, can, is it something you can handle? Yep, I can, absolutely. So um, this is, oh, I made it. oh, oh here I can, he is. <laughs> I can hear you guys. <laughs> so basically, we'll, we'll ignore the other Richard in the room here, uh, over on the side down here. <laughs> yeah, he's a liar. <laughs> <laughs> the evil twin. Yeah. The evil twin, the evil twin. I, I wish you'd change his name. <laughs> Uh, so basically, this is what it is. It's a, it's it's kind of like the e-cycle program or the light cycle program. It's a way that we can get recycle their paint and get it out of the waste stream, make it easy for them at no cost. Now I know what you're talking about. I remember that before. Okay. Yes. I'm very supportive of this one, guys. Yeah, okay. yeah we are. Right. You ran for that? No. <laughs> <laughs> In one room. <laughs> More, but since we're going for short form, we'll keep it at that. <laughs> yes. Loretta, what else you got? Um, other thing that I have is we did not put on here, but would like to bring the Roy Bode Road vacation um, for action before commission next week. And I apologize that we did not get that little bullet on here, but I'm requesting to get that wrapped up. I know we're going to have at least one citizen that was upset that it wasn't on there, but uh, yeah. the commissioners are ready to move it forward. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do you mean, Commissioner Netherland? Well, you, you know, one that joins us quite regularly, uh, I know for sure that he follows this specific uh, action item and it not being on the agenda there will be an email I'm sure explaining to us that it was not appropriate to move forward without it him having an opportunity to be here to to hear it well we certainly had previous briefings and we'll follow up directly with that individual and make him um, advise him that we're planning to put it on the action agenda commissioner Oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess I should get in here. <laughs> get in here. Um, and then the other item, if that's, if, oh, sorry, is did, that. Did I, have, did I have two in favor of that? Yes. I know I have uh, Commissioner Trask, but Kevin, uh, you haven't. What's that? Are you in favor with putting oh, it on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I've been, in, I've been in favor, so I have no, no issue with that. Okay. Thank you. Next. Okay, and then uh, the other item that I have, Commissioner Schutte shared um, with me, Senator Patty Murray's infrastructure priority solicitation form. Yay. And commissioners, if you like, I can get that filled out. It's for um, identifying priority transportation projects. And we can submit, I guess there are, are non-project things that can be emphasized. Um, and then also regional and local transportation projects. And I would welcome your thoughts, commissioners, on that. In terms of regional, we could certainly highlight the Gorst work and continued work on the freight corridor. Local projects, we would I would propose emphasizing the design and construction of the local access connectors to the freight corridor and funding for the SR 300 Old Belfair Clifton Road roundabout or intersection improvements. And in terms of um, other priorities that at the federal level, we could emphasize the need to continue to fund the local county network, streamline permitting, and um, increase federal funding for fish barriers. Loretta, can you re remind us again when this is, when Senator Murray was hoping to get the, the uh, former list yeah. back? Yeah, good question. 
I'd have to take a look -y here. Email. I'm sorry, Commissioner. I'm always assuming like everything legislature <laughs> related. It was yesterday, right? Yeah. I don't see a date. Oh, oh drafted by April. Okay. But we do have next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could bring a, a draft back for commissioner's review at next briefing. Yeah, that might, I mean, that might be good. Um, you know, a lot of it is, is going to be probably based on our, our one and six year tip anyway. Um, so, but just a, a kind of review of that before it gets shot off, probably be okay. Okay. Any other um, thoughts or points to emphasize commissioners? No, I think you hit them pretty mm -hmm. solidly. Okay. All right. I good will to see, good to see it's infrastructure week once again in DC. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Anything for us, commissioners? You guys have anything for them, commissioners? No, just a big thank you to the road crew. They did amazing um during this the snowstorm. And so please, please let them send our or send my thanks to them for doing such a great job. Oh, thank you, commissioners. We did um, and passed along also for our utility folks. It's <laughs> and solid waste. They they have their own <laughs> challenges as well during the snow. I was really, really pleased with how well supported our entire team was and the work that our crew did to help with our utilities support as well. Great communications back and forth and kept things rolling as best we could. So thank you. Thank you for your support. And we'll definitely pass that along to our, our team. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one other thing just um, regarding the, uh, the Senator Murray's request, um, you know, it might be helpful to talk with uh, both of the PUDs and talk about utility um, mm -hmm. uh, relocation um, being included uh, in, in the cost or, or the funding when we do the fish barrier projects and things like that. Okay. Um, and then anything commissioners from the MTA, that would be the other thing that we would want to include. And I can certainly reach out to Mason Transit um, and get their thoughts as well. But any anything in particular from your perspective on the transit side? Um, I think just the, the roundabout up in, in uh, the Belfair area. Okay. All right. All right, uh, so for me, uh, just because I don't want to come behind your back uh, on the thing, I'm going to be asking you to put together uh, the cost uh, for replacement of the piece on that Roy Bode Road, uh, the cost that it would be for us to replace it here in the near future uh, if we were to move uh, forward with vacation, the cost that it would be if we had to go to court to try and, and replace that uh, from that neighbor, because uh, that's how much we're given that entity. I'd also like to know uh, um, if there was any petition from the landowner that the vacation goes further than what we're doing. Are we going to leave that piece uh, still there on the other person on the Lewis property because the the actual Roybo Road continues further than the person that actually put in the application and if that's the case uh, have we put in anything on our own because it's two separate things by law that the applicant can do theirs but if if this other person didn't ask for it are we planning on trying to take that vacation from them and has there been any consideration for his access onto his property, because that is a legal access for him to use as well. So those will be some of the questions I'm gonna ask you at the time when, when this comes up. Okay, great. Thank you're, you. You're Commissioner. more than welcome to call me if you want me to clarify that a little bit more. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. All right, anybody else have anything else for Public Works? Thank you very much. All right, thank Please you. Please drive through and, and don't forget your French fries. <laughs> All right, uh, Commissioner discussion. Is there any commissioner discussion? I have nothing. I think I'm good. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, hearing no objection, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>